Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall, practitioner of the seventh oldest profession, storyteller, spinner of tales, weaver of dreams, especially those that are dark and foreboding. An ancient poet wrote, forgetfulness, sweet and blessed forgetfulness, is the most precious gift of the immortal gods. For the innocent to forget and for the guilty to be forgotten is to receive finally the benediction of amnesia, the sweetest spirit of all. For amnesia sits patiently beside the never-ending stream of time, bestowing her largesse on the innocent and the guilty alike. Jerry? Jerry? Eric? What's wrong? Uh, I'm in trouble. Well, what kind of trouble? I'm scared. I'm scared to death. I know, I know. Whatever it is, kid, I'll stand by you. Now, what did you do? I killed a man. Oh, all right, kid. Now, now, who was it? A man named Jamie Parsons. Who? They said his name is Jamie Parsons. Oh, Eric. <laughs> How could you kill Jamie Parsons? I did. I did. I shot him ten minutes ago. No, kid, you didn't. Now, how could you? Jamie Parsons has been dead for 50 years. Our mystery drama, A Bride for Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We are still a young and boisterous country filled with optimism and high spirits. At least we like to think we are. And we endorse positive thinking. We're convinced that the pot of gold lies at the end of the rainbow and that sterling silver lines every cloud. 
And so our language has no word to match one that is so familiar to the Germans. Weltschmerz, which means a melancholy weariness with the futility of life. Which is not to say that we don't encounter it here and there. We do. But it's not really what you could consider a mainstream affliction. Well, good morning, Martha. Oh, I'm just taking your pancakes off the griddle. <laughs> well, that's life. You know what life is? Timing. Now, you be there at that exact split second. Now, that's and... enough, Jerry. Two philosophers in this house at one time is more than I can put up with. Well, is Shakespeare down yet? And don't call him Shakespeare. Well, why not? He's a poet, ain't he? Oh, here. Feed your face and give us a rest. <laughs> okay, okay. Now. Uh, you tell me. Now, here's a boy, 25 years old. He's been to college. Means he's got brains. He's good looking. Means he's got no problem with women. Jerry. Hmm? I'm worried about Eric. Worried? <laughs> We're crying out loud. What's his problem? Oh, I don't know. Well, it doesn't help that he can come running to his big sister any time he needs it. just that, I don't know, he feels rejected. Rejected? Well, that boy is, is welcome wherever he goes. No, Jerry. He's actually being rejected by the editors. He sends his poetry into a magazine, and back it comes with a rejection slip. Well, <clears throat> I, uh... I read some of those poems, and, I, well, I couldn't make head or tail out. Oh, what do you know? Well, I know what I like. You know what he ought to do? He should get a job. He's trying to find himself. Oh, I pass. Good morning. Oh, Eric, you're just in time for breakfast. I only want some coffee. Uh, you can tell that this is a city, boy. Eric, you really ought to have a good breakfast. Uh, sugar and... Fresh cream, Eric? I'll take it black. I, I've got this headache. Oh, look, you better see a doctor. No, 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 he doesn't need a doctor. He needs to have a good time, a really little hell. Hey, why don't you come with us, Eric? Get into the dance at the Grange Hall tonight. Put your arm around a pretty girl, the whole world is different. <laughs> I wish the whole world could be different. Now, hey, Eric, uh, you just can't get serious at this hour in the morning. <laughs> uh, you going out for a ride. Saddle up Duke or Admiral and you just... Look at that sky, and you just breathe that air and enjoy that sun. And uh, you know how you feel? I remember that poem you once recited when you were a kid. And you'll say it again. God's in his heaven, and all's right with the world. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or... Whoa, whoa, do Hold it. Hold it, boy. I can't be. I can't be. It's a mirage. Stay here, Duke. There's plenty of nice grass. Have your lunch. I have to find out about this. Incredible. Out here? This type of architecture? Out here? Jamie, Jamie, darling, I knew you'd come. Oh. Uh, I'm oh. sorry, I'm not Jamie. Oh, I see. I, I've been waiting for Jamie to come back from the war. The war? Yes, the war. And now I know, now I know who you are. Well, uh, who am I? You are, you're Jamie's best friend, his buddy in the fight. And... Jamie fell and he died in your arms and with his dying breath, he made you swear to come and tell me I'm the only one he ever loved. But, uh... Well, after I finish crying for Jamie, you and I will fall in love. Uh, I, I almost wish that were true, but uh, th that's not what happened. I was just riding by and I was struck by the look of the house. Were you? It's fantastic. This ornate, late Victorian architecture is so... Perfectly preserved. Do you like it? It's, it's fascinating. Well, I think it's just too much gingerbread. <laughs> Granddad built it. I, I've never seen you around here. I'm visiting. Uh, Jerry Carraway is my brother-in-law. You can't mean Jerry. You mean Oscar. No. Oscar Carraway owns the farm over on Stillwell Creek. I think that's what they call it. Well, that's Oscar. <laughs> Jerry can't be anybody's brother-in-law. He's hardly a year old. 
Uh, I, well, I suppose we're talking about two different people. Now, if you're kin to the Caraways, I am going to invite you to come inside and have a nice cool glass of lemonade. Well, uh, thank you. Come on into the parlor, and we'll sit. I don't know what is the matter with me. My name is Julia Sanford. And I'm Eric Mills. I can't get over this. What? The um, way this place is furnished and that phonograph. Oh, yes. Everything is the latest from all the way over to Omaha. Everything is so authentic. <laughs> and I think the telephone is a great final touch. Well, it's just an ordinary old telephone. Old is right. Well, that's practically an antique. They used to have those uh, about the 1920s. I've seen them in the movies. Do you like movies? Well, well some of them. What's your favorite? Well, um, I have my own taste. I, I mean, my favorite movie happens to be... Uh, don't laugh. Birth of a Nation. I saw it at a retrospective in the museum. We saw that in town at the Bijou. Do you have a theater that shows old pictures? Old pictures, new pictures, any kind. Everything here is, is so... Uh... <laughs> so what? <laughs> well, that one word, it just covers everything. Authentic. Even your dress. Oh, this just a silly old... Well, you know, nowadays there's no style. There's no set style. The girls dress any which way, but yours is definitely 1920-ish. Well, I should hope so. Dad's taking me shopping to Omaha as soon as I get back from Washington. Oh, do you like politics? No. No, definitely not. Oh, don't you ever say that in front of Dad. I told you Dad's in Washington visiting with President Wilson. And he... But Wilson isn't the president. Oh, that's right, he isn't. <laughs> I can't get used to the idea of that new one, Mr. Hardin. Mr. Warren Gamaliel Hardin. <laughs> There's a mouthful for you. <laughs> but, uh... Dad was against him at the convention. The way you talk, I almost believe you. Why, you can read it in the newspapers. Dad is an important man. He's going to run for governor. You just ask Mr. Calloway if that's not so. No, no, no. What I mean oh, is... Oh, I hope it didn't sound like bragging on my part. Everything is so... You don't believe... You don't believe a word I say. All right, now here. Now just read it for yourself in yesterday's paper. Now what does that headline say? This is the... Rocky Mountain Advocate and Messenger, July 18th, 1921. Even the newspaper? It's so carefully preserved. <laughs> preserved? Why would anyone want to preserve a copy of the silly old ad mess? You always get a fresh one the next day. Oh, if, if only this period had never passed away. You know, I don't understand half the things you say, but I love to listen. <laughs> Do you suppose that I could call on you again? Oh, uh, well, I... I understand. There's a... There's a dance at the Grange Hall. How would you like to go? I'd love it. Great. I'll pick you up no. and... Oh, no. I... I better not. Why? Jamie. Jamie? We... We're engaged, and it wouldn't be right for me to go to a dance with another man. But... Jamie's been missing in action, you say, and... Yes, and everybody says he's dead. I'm sorry. And if I went to a dance with someone else, it would be my way of saying to the world that... that I thought he was dead, too, and I don't want to say that. I just don't want to say that. Julie, I don't think people would say that... You better not stay here any longer. Julie, if I said anything... Please go. I must ask you to leave. But Julia... Please! Supper in a half hour, Jerry. Mmm, <clears throat> that smells great. Now, whatever do you put in your stew? <laughs> Cooking is my business. <laughs> I have to hand it to you, Martha. It's a miracle business. I evidently has done wonders for Eric. He's chopping wood. He's humming a tune. Eric? Eric, happy as a jaybird. Oh, what's got into him? You're cooking. Now, what else? Oh. Hello, folks. How's our happy little homestead? Oh, Eric, darling, are, are you all right? No, I'm not all right. I'm magnificent, spectacular. <laughs> what's got...
gotten into you. What does the French say? Cherchez la femme. Oh, you be quiet. <laughs> oh, he's right. <laughs> Oh, well, who is she? Well, there may be one or two little complications there, but it's nothing I can't handle. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> tell you what? Tell me you had a museum here. Museum? Oh, there ain't no it's museum. It's a wild place, and it's a gem. It's authentic to the tiniest detail. Eric, please tell us what you're talking about. Dedicated to the 1920s. What is this museum? Oh, but there isn't any museum. Yes, yes, there is. Uh, where? Oh, come on now. Quit pretending. She works there. I suppose she's the curator. Who? Her name is Julia. Julia? Oh, you'd know who she is, Jerry, because she has to be the prettiest girl in town. Eric, this uh, museum, just just tell us where it is. Cut us down the road from here. It can't be more than two miles. It has the most beautiful garden and lawn... The house is a perfect example of Lake Victorian. I think it's called the Sanford House. It's the most beautifully kept... What, what are you looking at me like that for? Eric, the Sanford House is, is an old ruin. It's falling apart. Oh, but I was... Uh... And it's so overgrown that if you didn't know it was there, you, you couldn't even see it from the road. No, I was just inside, and it, it was... Eric... Are you sure that you... I was. I was inside the most beautiful... Uh, now, do you think you'd better see a doctor, Eric? Huh? But I was. Eric, uh, do you want us to ride back there with you and and prove it? Are you saying that the girl, the house, that the... was all a dream? But I wasn't dreaming. I know. I wasn't dreaming. <laughs> And he wasn't, because we were there, too. Unless it's possible that we were dreaming also. Well, every young man should have a wonderful girl of his dreams. And it's just fine, if that's where she stays. It's when she materializes that you can run into a problem. I shall materialize again shortly with Act Two. happens to the past? Or, put it this way, what is the past? Is it a record or an impression? Does it exist only as a rapidly receding and fading memory? Or does it maintain a solidity and a substance? Who has not remarked at least once, where has the time gone? Does this mean we really believe that time goes somewhere? If so, where? Eric Mills is convinced he has found the answer. I know I wasn't dreaming. Maybe you were, Eric. But everything was so real. All this is coming out of your head. It's your fantasy. But everything was so... I keep saying the word, authentic. He even knew your father's name, Jerry. Oscar. Well, it's like Martha says, Eric. Now, this is what you know. And... I never knew your father's name was Oscar. Of course you did. Not consciously, perhaps, but I can swear I saw yeah, yeah, Eric, yeah. Now, now, you did see it. Now, you wanted to see it. You know what I mean? I mean, for some reason, you... You got a notion that life was better in the twins. Wait a minute. Wait... 1920. Remember, Eric? Do you remember? Remember what? The Bartlesby Tavern and Inn. No, no. Oh, you do, you do. Up in Connecticut. Mom and Dad took us there every summer. What does what this have to... There was that poem printed on the wall. What poem? About the year 1920. The year the tavern was built. Well, I don't remember anything about oh, it. sure. Look, you weren't even four years old, and I, I recited the poem. And you were able to memorize it just from hearing me read it once. Oh, Mom thought you were a genius. I don't know what you're talking about, Martha. Listen, uh, see, now, I was built in 1920 in a time of peace, as a place of plenty. Let no care or trouble enter. Uh, oh, finish it for me, Eric. For love and joy are at my center. <laughs> you see? Well, what does that prove? I mean, that I could... That I could make up a whole thing about being back in the 20s? Ah, you could do anything. Jerry, 
What I mean is, with his imagination, anything is possible. Yes, and, and you've talked about the 20s. Oh, maybe I have. As a writer, as a poet, would you have rather lived then or now? Oh, hey, now what kind of question is that? Huh? He'd be dead now if he lived back then. He knows what kind of question it is. Whatever you say, I know where I was this morning. Yes, Jerry. Where you always wanted to be, back in the 20s, when, when it was easier to be a poet. Martha, everything is relative to when you were alive. But you'd rather have been alive when Hemingway was young. With Fitzgerald, you'd, you'd want to be in Paris with Gertrude Stein and Picasso. You feel that people like them would be more, well, more apt to notice your worth than the people of today. Well, what if that's true? I, I... What if it's true? Yeah, sure. I mean, the... Twenties were a more exciting time to be alive, but does that mean that I could just conjure them up? It's real. real. I knew it was real. Julia. Oh, now, I said I could not go to that dial. May I come in? Well. Just for a little while. All right, but just a little while. Julia, I had to come back to you. Eric, if you're going to start that kind of talk, I'll have to ask you to leave. Right now. After all. After all. After all, all, I am an engaged girl. Oh, listen. Isn't that a swell number? Oh. Now, I promised Dad I wouldn't use that word. What word? Swell. Dad hates slang. Julia, may I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. What year is this? <laughs> what kind of a question is that? Oh, please, Julia. Only this morning you saw the paper. What year is it? Is there a reason why you wouldn't know? Could you tell me? It is July 19th, 1921. You sure of that? <laughs> Honestly, Eric. <laughs> What's that? What's what? Did you hear it? All I hear is a train. That's what I mean, the train. There hasn't been a train here and. In... Oh, what are you saying? That's the ODP. The ODP? The Omaha, Denver, and Pacific, silly. Everybody knows. Are you sure you're all right? Yes. Yes, I'm sure. You know, this afternoon I promised you a glass of lemonade. I think you could use some refreshment now. Excuse me. I heard it. I know I heard it. Wait a minute. Hello? Hello? Uh, information, please. Do uh, you have a number for uh, Mr. Jerry Carraway? Jerry Carraway? Well, I know Oscar spoils that child something fierce, but he had about to give a year old baby a phone number of his own. Uh, do you want Oscar's number? Uh, wh- what's the number of the, uh, the the movie theater in town? How oh, far do you want to know? I, I want to find out what's playing. Well, ask me. I should know. There's a picture called Intolerance with just the greatest... Oh, no. No. What do you mean, no? I'm telling you what's playing at the movie theater. I mean, uh, I mean, it's wonderful. That's what I heard, but a lot of folks say it's a little too serious. Now, over at Council Falls, they got a funny comedy with that fatty Arbuckle. Now, he is a scream. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Anything else you, you want to know? I promise you won't laugh. Well, if it's funny, I can't promise. What a year is this? Uh, you're a coward, all right. What year is it? 1921. Everybody knows that. Thank you. Thank you. 1921. And here we have some of Amy's famous lemonade. Mm. Isn't it good? Mm. Mm. I never knew if the boys were coming over for me. <laughs> or for the lemonade. <laughs> Julia, 
Julia. What is it? I'm so happy. Oh, now just excuse me. Hello. Julia? Oh, what is it, Corjean? Julia, are you all right? Sure. Uh, why? Well, some man placed a call from your home just before. Yeah? And he sounded just a kind of bit peculiar to me. Oh, come on, Corjean. I was just, <laughs> just wondering, should I call mm-hmm. Sheriff Gates? Sometimes you are so silly. Well, better be silly than sorry. Good night. Eric, what did you say to scare Corjean? Poor Jean. <laughs> the telephone operator. I admit, I, I sounded crazy. What did you say? I asked her what year it was. So why do you have to keep asking? Don't you know? Julia, I could never explain it. And you could never understand. Then why bother? I want to stay here, Julia. Here? Here. Well, how would it look? Well, we could get married. But I... You, you what? There's... There's Jamie. World War One has been over for three years now. What'd you call it? World War One? If you haven't found him in those three Why years, did you call it World War One? He has got to be dead. Why did you call it World War One? Because in twenty years there's going to be World War Two. What? Listen, there can't be any more wars. After all we went through, uh, people aren't that stupid. Do you believe that? Well, what else can you believe? Julia, you have got to tell me. Do you love Jamie? Well, uh, what business is that of yours? I have to know. We we kept company for a while, and, and when he left for France, he asked me to wait for him, and... Could I... Could I say no? Are you in love with him? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Are you in love with him? Well, I... No. But I promise you that You can't I... make that kind of promise. You can't give him what you don't have. And what you don't have for him is love. Well, how do you know? Because you love me. Well, what... Make you think that I... You love me, Julia. You have to love me. Why? Because it's right. Because it makes sense. It simply has got to be. Oh, Eric. Don't waste time, Julia. There is so little time. People don't realize how little time they really have. Come on. Where? For a walk. (laughs) But there's no place to go. Oh, yes, there is. We'll go to town. Well, there's nothing doing. Yes, yes, I'll show you. You are having so much trouble with Dad's old car. I just can't get used to the way these gears shift. <laughs> well, here we are. It's beautiful. Well, nothing ever happens here. There's the drugstore, and the hay and feed store, and the moving picture house. And they just took the sidewalks in for the night. <laughs> That's a local joke, Eric. <laughs> Oh, and the train. Well, let's stop at the station. Well, if somebody flags it down. Uh oh. What's the matter? Oh, Miss Old Lady Haskins, I don't want her to see me out with a fellow. It'd be all over town. Take me home, Eric. <laughs> No, no, just sit by me for a while. Why am I thinking of a certain poem? I don't know. Why do I see the words? From too much love of living, from fear and hope set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods there be, that no life lives forever. That dead men rise up never. That even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to sea. Oh, I like that. I believe it. 
No life lives forever. Let dead men rise up never. Let even the weariest river wind somewhere safe to sleep. Oh, would you write that down for me, Eric? Of course, darling, Here's of course. Piece of paper and a pencil. That, uh, no. that no life lives forever. Oh, Eric. Eric, I know now, I know in my heart, that Jamie is, Jamie is dead, and I'm glad. I shouldn't have said that, but, but, but you see, now I know that our love, which is so sweet to us, will cause no one else pain. And even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Here. Oh, Eric. This is the first gift you ever gave me. We're safe. We're safe here. It's just as I dreamed it would be. Oh, oh, that must be Dad calling from Washington, D.C. He's probably going to tell me about his meeting with the President. Well, I'll have more important news for him. And I want you to say hello to Dad. <laughs> hello, Daddy? Daddy? Among the beautiful sounds of this beautiful world, we hear introduced a new note. And we know very well it must be a note of discord. And was the poet right? Is it true that dead men rise up never? Where has Jamie come from? And where is he going? I shall have the answers when I return shortly with Act Three. Suddenly, it's 1921 for Eric Mills, who wasn't even born then. 1921, a year of innocence and, most important, peace. Not just the absence of war, but peace. And Eric Mills has somehow sought it out as a refuge from the deceptions and the dejections of the jet age. He has even found Julia, but so has Jamie. Julia's doughboy fiancé, who evidently didn't die at Chateau Thierry. Jamie, tell me you were dead. They, they left me for dead. And for a long time, I, I didn't know who I was. And then I remembered. I remembered you. And I've come home. Jamie, I've got to... I just got off the train. Jamie, dear. I'm coming home, Julia. I'm coming home to you. And then I'll run from the station. I'll run all the way. Jamie, wait. You remember I've got how I can run all the way? I can run even faster. Jamie, there is something I must tell you. There is something I must tell you. I'll see you very soon. It's Jamie. And he's alive. Darling, you and I, we love each other. But uh, that was before... Uh, before what? Before I knew Jamie was alive. Our love has nothing to do with anyone but else. Jamie still believes... A lie. Oh, don't say it that way. How else can I say it? If you love me, then Jamie believes a lie. Oh, Eric, please, go. Go. Quickly. Why? Before I get there. No. I'm frightened. Don't be. I'm, I'm frightened. I'm here. No, darling, I'm frightened. Not for me, for you. Julia, there is nothing to be frightened of. It is. You don't know him the way I do. It doesn't matter. He's got a violent temper. He'll be bad enough to... Kill you. Well, I'll have something to say about that. Who says he can kill me? Is it better if you kill him? It's better for me. Oh, Eric, I don't want you to... To what? To be hurt. What can I do? I won't give you up. Oh, I don't know what to do. I am... Julia, you love me. I love you. We have a right to be happy. And Jamie... Sometimes there's only one way to say something. The only way I can say it is it's... Just too bad about Jamie. But I don't want us to hurt him. If Jamie is reasonable and sensible, why should anyone be hurt? Eric, he's here. He's here. Yes, darling. Oh, I'm terribly frightened. Listen, Jamie is uh, crazy. He's always been 
been a little bit crazy, but now... Julia. Oh, Julia, darling, I've come back home. Janie. Hello, Janie. Hello, Jane. Jamie, is that all you can say? Jamie, uh... Uh, Hey, who's this? Jamie Parsons. Eric Mills. Uh... Who are you? He's a friend. That's not exactly true. I am more than a friend. Julia and I plan to get married. You what? You heard what I said. Uh, Never mind. Never mind what you said. I want to hear what Julia says. Well? (laughs) Well, now, is it true? Oh, Jamie. Oh, Jamie, what? Now, is it or isn't it true? Now, Jamie, you and me, we never will really formally no, engage. I, I asked you to wait for me. And I, I, I... And you promised that you would. Because you were going away. Now, let's get this straight. You mean... You... You mean you are throwing me over for... Listen, thi- why don't for... we just all sit down and talk and tell Oh, no, oh, no, no. No, you're... you're... You aren't going to walk out on me. Now, never. Just a minute. Now, listen, I know you. You're slick and smart and smooth talking. And you hang around while a guy is off doing something important while while he's fighting for his country. And you you take advantage. That's not the way it happened at all. Why don't we talk about Uh, this? All all right. All right, buddy. Now, look. I don't know who you are, but this is your lucky night. Now, you won't get hurt, provided you just... Provided you just walk out of here fast. Look. I know how you feel, but she doesn't love you. She's been in love with me since we're both ten years old. Now, you tell him, Julia. Jamie, listen. But don't you see what she's trying to tell you? She doesn't love you. Julia! Julia, you you can't tell me that. He is not going to have you. No. Jamie, don't. Please, put that Uh, pistol away. No, 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 no. He won't have you. You won't. Please, don't kill him. Why not? Please. Who deserves killing more, huh? Jamie. What do you think kept me alive all these, those months in the hospital thinking of you, dreaming of you, picturing how it would be well, well, when I got back home? Well, I am home now, and I know what i got to do. I I'm... won't let you. Get away from him. No. Now, listen, listen, ain't that just your style, huh? Hiding behind a woman's skirts. I don't have to hide anywhere. <laughs> Get the better let go of that gun. I can, I'm going to kill you. Stop, no. stop it, both of you. Stop it. Stop. Uh, I... Jamie? Oh, oh, who is it, Julia? Who oh, is it? Is it? He's... He's dead. I didn't mean to. You saw that. I... I didn't want... Who... Who are you? Eric. I'm Eric. Who are you? Eric, the man who loves you. Oh, oh yeah. I need someone to love me. I need someone to love me now. And now that Jamie's gone. What can we do about Jamie? There's only one thing I can do. Give myself up. No, they put you in prison. I have to pay for Jamie. I'll turn myself in. No, Eric. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. I have to do it. Don't leave me. <laughs> wait, wait for me, Julia. Will you wait for me? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for the sheriff. Eric. Now, Eric, boy. The sheriff. Where's the sheriff? I killed the man. You didn't kill anybody. Eric. Where am I? Eric, Eric, dear, drink this. Now, 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 what has gotten into you? I killed a man. What are you saying? Who? His name is Jamie. Jamie Parsons. We were having a fight over this girl I told you about, Julia Sanford. Eric, you have got to listen now. Jamie Parsons was killed way back in uh, 1920 or thereabout. No! Please listen, Eric. Don't tell me I'm crazy. Eric, look, we found you wandering around on the road. I was looking for the sheriff. Eric, now way back after the first war, Jamie Parsons came home. Now, he was sweet on Julia Stanford. Now, he was also crazy. Maybe it was what they call uh, shell shock in those days. But anyway, he tried to kill her, and somehow the, the gun went off and killed him. No, no, I wasn't there. Yeah, I no, 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 no. It was too much for Julia. After her father died, she 
She shut herself up all alone. That big house, it just went to ruin, you know. She kind of uh, lost her marble. Oh, you're talking about someone else. Now, her dad, Big Jim, was my godfather. And so we go over there regular. Now, we bring her food and uh, we'll see that she's still alive. But let me show you. No, Eric. I think the time has come for us to show you. <laughs> No, this can't be the place, the lawns, the gardens, flowers. It was, it was like a park. Eric, this is the Sanford place. But the house is falling apart. Now, you can see that... But it was so beautiful just yesterday. Oh, Eric, not yesterday. Fifty years ago. But I tell you, I... Eric, dear, when we meet her, smile. She gets very upset if people don't smile. I hear the bell. The doorbell. That's the same. Oh, who is it? Morning, Miss Judy. Who, who are you? Uh, it's Jerry. You remember me, Miss Judy? I'm Jerry. Oscar Caraway's boy. Oh, Jerry. How is your dad? Why, just fine, Miss Judy. Just fine. My dad is still in Washington. Uh huh? I expect him home any time. But the president keeps him there. Oh, come in. Come in. The uh, phonograph. Uh, Martha's here, too. Well, I am so glad. How are you, Martha? Just fine, Miss Julia. And uh, we brought a guest. Oh, you know I don't like to meet strangers. This I have a chance to dress up. First, Martha, you should have told me. But he's not I a stranger. Don't... Now, he's kin. That's Martha's baby brother. Oh, well, that's different. His name is Eric. Well, how do you do, Eric? How do you do, Miss Junior? Amy! Amy! He's bringing a pitch of lemonade and four glasses. Eric, Amy's been dead 50 years. Eric, Eric, Eric. Now, I knew when Eric was a sweet boy was home from the war. Uh, you mean Jamie? No, 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 no. His name was Eric. We were in love. <laughs> so much in love. We didn't stay long. You all right, Miss Julia? I mean, is there anything you need? He uh, I wrote down a poem for me. I look at it every day. Every day. Read it. Read it, Eric. It is so beautiful. Oh, be careful. That paper is old and falling apart. <laughs> Just like me. And the ink has faded. I, uh, Can you read it? From too much love of living. From hope and fear set free. We thank with brief thanksgiving... Whatever gods there be, that no life lives forever. That dead men rise up never. Never. That even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. See. La vida es sueño. Life is a dream, as the Spanish poet said. And even dreams are dreams. In that case, when are we dreaming? When are we awake? If we can't tell for sure who we are, how can we possibly know who we were? But whether here or in a dream, I, at least, shall be back shortly. To complete our expedition into poetry, the greatest poet of them all said, All the world's a stage, and all of us are players. And so this raises the logical question, are we a permanent cast? Do we keep coming back to play the roles for which we are best suited? 
Have we led these lives before? Well, you just listen to us again, and for an hour anyhow, you'll be able to lead a brand new life. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Bryna Rayburn, Marion Seldes, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. And we are left with all the dirty work. What do you mean? The time has really come for you to stop asking the very answerable question. In the name of medicine and research, we gather bodies, right? But that is no crime. Using already dead flesh, which can render up to us secrets of how to handle living flesh, is not a valid crime. On that basis, you have an argument. If the flesh is already moribund, but body snatching is a rewarding crime... And if there is no dead body to snatch, with the kind of man who plies this trade, do you think he would hesitate to wait for the flesh to die if his source of supply ran low? Oh, good Lord, what do you say? If your conscious brain will not admit the truth, your subconscious one knows it. And you signed for the bodies tonight. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. California, Monday, June 8th. The Lux Radio Theater, presented from its new home on Hollywood Boulevard, Hollywood, California. Lux Present Hollywood. Such great personalities as William Powell, Myrna Loy, W.S. Van Dyke, Theda Barra, James Seymour, Minna Gumbel, Porter Hall, and many others will take part in this presentation sent to you by the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the beauty soap of the stars. Appearing before a distinguished Hollywood audience, Mr. Powell, Miss Loy, and a cast of 18 great players present the play that has broken box office records from coast to coast. The Thin Man. And as producer tonight, we present the director who did The Thin Man on the screen, together with such triumphs as Naughty Marietta, Trader Horn, Rose Marie, I Live My Life, and countless other smash hit pictures, Mr. W.S. Van Dyke. Mr. Van Dyke. Well, it's a great scene at the Lux Radio Theater tonight. In our audience, we have Betty Davis, Jimmy and Lucille Gleason, Bob Armstrong, Ole Olson of Olson and Johnson, Stu Irwin, J. 
Jimmy Starr, Samuel Scomulus, Evelyn Venable, Mr. and Mrs. Leon Schlesinger. Maybe it would interest you a little inside information on the show we are doing tonight, The Thin Man, and about William Powell and Myrna Loy, who are going to do it for you. As you know, The Thin Man was a best-selling novel by Dashiell Hammett. Hunt Stromberg, down at the studio, MGM, got a hold of it and brought it to me. Woody, he said, if you'll make this picture, I'll buy the story. Well, I read it, and while it was a good enough mystery story, there was something else about the book that struck me. Here was something new and fresh and very charming, a romance between a man and his wife. It's a story of a couple of kids that understood each other and had a blessed confidence in each other. Beneath all the casualness and all the wise cracking, there's a lovely, wholesome relationship. Something really deep and sweet and inspiring. Well, we decided to make the picture. Albert Hackett and Francis Goodrich wrote a swell script. William Powell and Myrna Loy played the parts. And how? They played them beautifully. Because Powell was just Powell and Loy was just Loy. Both of them wise, cracking all the time and clowning right through the picture. I suppose you know that plenty of motion pictures take from two months to a year to shoot. We did The Thin Man in 16 days, retakes and all. Of course, it wasn't a pretentious picture. We didn't make it as one. I hate epics. But it is evident that people liked it. It has been very interesting to study out how they could tell this story on the radio. Bill and Myrna have had a lot of fun getting it ready for you, just as they did making the picture. And from the original story, from the original motion picture cast, we have, and are fortunate in having, Minna Gombo, Porter Hall, William Henry, and Thomas Jackson here tonight. So here we go, with William Powell and Nick Charles, and Myrna Loy as Nora in The Thin Man. Here they come, Bill Powell and Myrna Loy. We're in a fashionable cafe, Momart, New York City. It's Christmas Eve, and the well-appointed dining room is filling rapidly. From the bar comes a good-looking young fellow of about 35, tall, casual, and worldly-wise. He's Nick Charles, the well-known private detective, played by William Powell. And he's waiting for his charming wife, Nora, played by Myrna Loy. As he takes his place at the table, a young girl on the other side of the room recognizes him and hurries over. Aren't you Mr. Nick Charles, the detective? Oh, I am. Uh, yes, I'm Nick Charles. I thought I recognized you. My name is Dorothy Wynan. Oh, yes, how do you do? You mind if I sit down for a no, moment? No, but uh, I'm expecting my wife a few minutes. You don't mind explaining her presence to her? Oh, of course. That's my fiancé over there at the other table. Oh, well, that makes everything all right, doesn't it? Sit down. Thank you. Uh, your name is... Uh... Dorothy Wynan. I'm Clyde Wynan's daughter. Clyde Wynan. Uh... Oh, yes, of course, your father was having some trouble about one of his inventions a few years ago. I handled the case for him. I know. That's, that's why I want to speak to you now. Oh. Well, I'm not practicing anymore, Miss Wynett. You see, I've retired. Please, Mr. Charles. I need you. Oh. What seems to be the trouble? It's dead. He went away about three months ago, and I haven't heard from him. Not a word. I'm worried sick. Oh, I wouldn't if I were you. After all, he's an inventor. He gets an idea he wants to work on. It's only natural that he should hide away somewhere. He's done it before. Yes, but never for three months. Did you see him before he left? No. Mr. Macaulay was the only one he spoke to. Well, Macaulay and Julia Wolfe. She's Dad's secretary. Julia Wolfe. Oh, yes, I believe I met her. And Macaulay is your father's lawyer, isn't he? Yes. His lawyer and his secretary both speak to him before he leaves, but no one knows where he went. He wouldn't tell them. What about your mother? He wouldn't tell her either? No. Mother and Dad aren't... They haven't seen each other for some time. Oh, I see. Well, I don't know just what I can do for you. Why don't you speak to Macaulay? Maybe he's heard from your father and forgotten to let you know. Oh, well, I'll call him now. That's a girl. Let me know how it turns out, will you? Of course. I'll be back in a few minutes. I'll be here. <laughs> Madam, you can't bring that dog in here. Dogs aren't allowed. I'm sorry, uh, ma'am. I'll be here. Aster. Aster, come here, boy. Here. Down, yeah, boy. Madam, down. it isn't only your dog. We allowed everyone. Oh, here you are. Aster. Quiet, Aster. Quiet. Hello, Nora. I hear you brought the dog. I didn't bring him. He brought me. I think the doorman's mad, Nick. Madam, I'm afraid you'll have to take the dog outside. It's all right, Joe. It's my dog and uh, my wife. You might have mentioned me first. But, Mr. Charles, are you sure that... Uh... Of course I'm sure. He's well-trained. He'll behave himself. And nobody might bite someone. No, no. Only me, Joe. He only bites me. Yes, he's fussy about what he eats. Go ahead, Joe. I'll be responsible for it. Very well, sir. If you say so. There you are, my dear. See what an influential husband you've got? 
You do stand in the door, ma'am. Mr. Charles. Oh, uh, yes, Dorothy? May I introduce my fiancé, Andy Reed, Mr. Charles? How do you do? How do you do, sir? Any luck, Dorothy? Yes, he's just around the corner. Your father? No, no, Mr. McCall. We're going to see him now. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, oh, Nick? Yes, my dear? Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, Miss Winant, Mr. Reed, my wife. How do you do? How do you do? I'm sorry we have to rush, but you'll excuse us, Mr. Charles. Of course. Uh, we're to Normandy for a couple of weeks. Why don't you drop around? Thanks, we will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Charles. Goodbye. Pretty girl. You like blonde. You got tight? Only you, darling. Lanky brunettes with wicked jaws. Who is she? Dorothy Winant, daughter of Clyde Winant. I worked on a case for her father. Some nut wanted to kill him. Charming. What's the matter now? Winant disappeared. Dorothy's afraid something happened to him. Has anything happened to him? My darling wife. How do I know? Funny, though. That secretary of his ought to know something. Secretaries usually do. Who is she? Julia Wolfe. Smart girl, Julia. I always suspected she had some kind of hold on Winant. That's why he kept her on. Maybe you ought to give her a ring. What for? Oh, just to say hello. Mm, maybe. Want a nickel? Hmm? No, 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 I've got one. I'll be right back. Hello? I want the Skylar, 40962. No, Skylar. Uh, that's right, 40962. Hello? Yes, you were speaking. Who? Oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Charles. Yes? Well, what was it you wanted to... Oh. Oh, no, I don't. He didn't tell me. Not a word. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Goodbye. Morelli. Tell me. Well, who was that? Nick Charles. The detective? He wanted to know where Winant was. Oh, yeah? Why? He didn't say. Did anyone see Winant come here that night? The night you and him had the scrap? I don't know. Oh, no? Well, I guess I'll scrap. Wait a minute, Morelli. Where are you going? You're taking a little stroll, that's all. If Nick Charles is going to pop up around here, I want to be far away when he does. Ah, oh, don't be a fool, Morelli. Fool, huh? Hey, listen, sister, I got a record nine inch and to come face to face with no dick. Sit down, Morelli. You need money, don't you? Yeah. What about it? You got some? Plenty. I'm wine and secretary. Oh, yeah? What do you mean by that? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> Your friend Pierre served good dinners, Nick. Uh-huh. All right. You still didn't tell me what Julia Wolfe had to say. Nothing. She didn't know where he was, that's all. Finished? Finished. Let's get out. We'll grab a cab and get back to the hotel. Ready and willing. Where's my purse? Come on, Esther. Joe, mommy cab. Hello? Hello? Asta, be quiet. Stop it. Hello? Yes? Who is it? Miss... Oh, he is. I see. Thank you. Oh, Nick? Yeah? It's Mr. McCauley. He's on his way up. McCauley? What would he want? Isn't he Warren's lawyer? Yeah. Maybe he's got some news. Well, he ought... Say, you're worrying an awful lot about this business. Forget it. I'll open it. I'm Mrs. Charles. Come in, Mr. McCauley. Hello, McCauley. Well, hello, Charles. Well, how are you? Fine. Sit down. Well, thanks. <clears throat> uh, Dorothy told me you were here. I took the liberty of coming to see you. Of course. Uh, Charles, uh, what's Mimi up to? Mimi? Oh, Dorothy's mother. Does she have to be up to something? <laughs> she usually is, trying one way or another to get money out of wine. At... I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to find out if you were, uh... <laughs> Sleuthing for her. I haven't been a detective four years. Oh, you don't say. 
Oh, my wife's father died and left her lumber mill, the Narragage Railroad, and uh, oh, a couple of other things. I- I'm looking out for them. I see, I see. What's all the fuss about? Is Wynett in hiding? Mm, you know as much about it as I do. I haven't seen him in three months. He sends word through Judy Wolf when he wants money. I give it to her and she gives it to him. Mine? Hello? Oh, just a moment, please. It's for you, Mr. McCollum. Your office. Oh, thank you. Hello? What? He is? Well, where is he? Oh, very well. Well, he's back in town. Mr. Wynan? Yes, thank heaven. He's waiting for me now. Well, I've got to rush. I'll tell you, it's no joke working for a man like that. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Charles. Goodbye, Charles. Hello? <clears throat> Merry Christmas. Same to you. Almost Christmas, darling. Is that a hint? You can drop it. You get your present at breakfast, not a minute before. See? You know, Nick, I've been thinking. It's funny the way Wyant popped up all of a sudden. Yes. Wasn't it? You think there's anything behind it? Why should there be? Well, I don't know. It just strikes me as being funny, that's all. You're nearer than I am, darling. Hello? Speaking. Oh, hello, darling. What? When? Oh, please. Well, yes, of course I'll be here. What is it, darling? Darling, what is it? Julia Wolf has just been murdered. <laughs> listening to William Powell and Myrna Loy and the story of the Thin Man from the stage of the Lux Radio Theater in Hollywood Boulevard. Before we go on with the story of Nick and Nora, we want to take you on a quick tour of Hollywood. Lobby of the Hotel Roosevelt, where stars and newcomers gather. A young actress just breaking into pictures is telling her friend of her success. Well, there's one thing... I've got one of the best managers in Hollywood, and that means a lot. Oh, but the rules he's laid down for me. Gee, what do you mean, rules? Well, you'd think I was going into training for the Olympics. I've got to lose five pounds. I've got to take lessons in singing and diction, and of course my complexion's got to be perfect. I've got to be more careful than ever not to get little blemishes or enlarged pores and what they call cosmetic skin. Thank goodness I know enough to use Lux Toilet Soap regularly, the way everybody around here does. Nine out of ten beautiful Hollywood screen stars use Lux toilet soap and have for years. Here's what the famous Claudette Colbert has to say. When I tell people how simple my complexion care is, they always seem surprised. I use cosmetics, of course, but I always use Lux toilet soap to guard against cosmetic skin. It's easy to keep skin lovely my way. And now on with the show of the Thin Man. An hour has gone by since Nick heard about the murder of Julia Wolfe. In the living room of their suite at the hotel, Nick and Nora are listening to the radio. A news reporter is broadcasting the latest developments of the case. And here's the latest news of the Julia Wolfe murder. The police have found out that the beautiful blonde secretary was a gangster's girl and is spreading the dragnet for one Joe Morelli, said to be hiding out somewhere in the city. In Paris today, the Chamber of Deputies... Never mind the Chamber of Deputies. Joe Morelli, that's what I want to know about. Well, did you get any more information out of headquarters? As much as I had... Julia Wolfe was shot and killed about 9 or 9.30. Body discovered on the floor of the living room a little after 11. Who discovered it? That'll surprise you. Mimi Wynant. Dorothy's mother? Right. What was she doing there? I don't know. Where's Clyde Wynant? Still missing. Missing? But Macaulay was going to see him. They had an appointment. Well, I spoke to Macaulay. Wynant never showed up. Nobody knows where he is. It's going to be pretty tough on Dorothy, isn't it? Meaning what? Meaning that it looks as if Clyde Wynant skipped one appointment in order to keep another with Julia Wolf. You think he killed her? Oh, it's just a guess. You're the detective around here, darling. Oh, that's Dorothy. You said you wanted to see me. Yes, come in, Dorothy. Thank you. Is anyone here? That's Nora. Have a seat. Oh. Hello, Dorothy. I'm 
I'm sorry for breaking in on you like this. Oh, that's all right. We're used to it. Anything wrong? Ju- Julia Wolf is dead. Yes, we know that. Here's the gun she was shot with. What are you trying to tell me? That you did it? Yes. I hated her. She she kept me from seeing my father. I went down there to ask her where he was. She wouldn't tell me. I shot her. Where did you hit her? Why, in the heart. Pretty good shot you are. What did she do? She fell down. Did she make any sound? Didn't scream? I don't know. Which way did she fall? She, she fell over backwards. Oh, yes? People fall toward a shot, you know, not back from it. I knew you were lying. Oh. <laughs> All right, come on, now, brace up. Where did you get this gun? I bought it in a pawn shop. I thought so. Why did you say you did it? Whom are you trying to shield? Oh, please, don't ask me. You've got to tell me. Nick, let me handle this, will you? Dorothy, look at me. Nick is trying to help you. Why don't you help him? You were trying to shield your mother, weren't you? No. Your father, then. <laughs> Dorothy. Yes. My father. Why did you think he did it? Mother was the first one to find Julia Wolf. She saw something in Julia's hand and she took it. What was it? A watch chain. It, it belonged to my father. So you think your father did it? I don't know. I don't know. Did your mother turn the chain over to the police? No, she, she kept it. She didn't tell them anything about it. But she showed it to you. Yes. Why did your mother go to Julia Wolf's apartment in the first place? She, she went to us for money. Oh, money again, huh? <laughs> yes? Oh, uh, have him come up, please. Yes. Who is it? Uh, Dorothy, uh, I wonder if you'd mind waiting in the bedroom. Of course. It'll be only a minute. Well, Nick? It's Mimi Wyman. Alone? She's never alone. Dorothy's brother is with a screwy college kid. And, uh... Some guy by the name of Chris Jorgensen. Jorgensen? Who's he? Macaulay told me about him. A hanger-on type. I think he's out for Mimi's dough. But she hasn't any. Maybe that's why she wanted to get some from Julia. I'll take it. Hello. Nick, how old are you? Fine. Come in, Mimi. Thank you, Nick. This is my son, Gilbert. How are you? Very well, thank you. And Mr. Chris Jorgensen, he's an old friend of mine. How do you do? How do you do? Sit down. Sit down, uh, uh, my wife. How do Mrs. you do? Mrs. Winant, uh, Gilbert Winant, and Mr. Jorgen. How do you do? Well, Mimi? Nick, I've never been in such a state in my life. You know, of course, that I was the one who found Julia Wolf. So we've heard. Oh, my dear, it was terrible. I walked in and there she was, lying dead on the floor. I meant to ask you, Mother, was there much blood? Gilbert, don't be so morbid. But I'm interested in murders. You know, Mr. Charles... I formed a theory about this one already. That's so. In my opinion, the man who did it... Was... Gilbert, be quiet. You don't know anything about it. Oh, but I do. Be quiet. Uh, you were saying, Mrs. Warnon, about finding Julia Wolfe. I was simply petrified. And such a mystery. Clyde Warnon's crazy. Absolutely crazy to stay away at a time like this. No one of the police think he had something to do with it. What do you think? Oh, I know he didn't. But I wish I could find him. I have something very important to tell him. And Macaulay won't help at all. He thinks I just want money. Well, don't you? <laughs> oh, Nick, you're always teasing. <laughs> Mrs. Wyman, were you alone when you found Julia Wolf? Why, of course I was. Wasn't Mr. Jorgensen with you? I? Certainly not. I don't know anything about it. The first word I had that Julia Wolf was dead was when Mrs. Wyman called me at my club. Oh, she called you? Yes. Why? I beg your pardon. Oh, let's not even talk about it. The thing to do is to find Clyde. And that's what I've come to you for, Nick. You will help me find him, won't you? I'm afraid I can't, Mimi. Oh, Nick, please. Now, Mimi, there are a thousand detectives in New York. Hire one of them. But Clyde knows you. All you have to do is to get in touch with him and tell him that Mimi says everything is all right, but that I've got to see him. I tell you again, I don't want any part of it. Is that final? Final. Well, if that's the way you feel... You turn up, you just help all you can. Give the police every possible assistance. What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing in particular. Oh. Well, we'll say good night. Good night. I'm sorry I can't help you, Mimi. the Normandy Hotel? I want to speak to Mr. Charles. Yeah. Nick Charles. Hello, Mr. Charles. Say, 
I'm sorry I woke you up. Uh, but, Mr. Charles, I'd like to lay a proposition before you. It's about the murder of Julia Wolf. Well, what's the difference who I am? Oh, wait a minute. All right. Wait a minute. Don't hang up. I'll tell you who I am. But you've got to keep it under your hat. I'm Al Nunheim. Yeah. Nunheim. Now, listen. I know who murdered Julia Wolf, see? Sure I do. And I'll spill it to you for five grand. I'll tell you how I know. Because I was outside of her apartment when she was shot. And I saw the one who did it. And I'll spill it to you when I get... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, I can't talk now. I'll call you again. Hello? Hello? Hello, are you still there? Hello? Well, for the... No, my darling. I don't know. I'm crank, I guess. He hung up. Uh, you better get back to bed and get some sleep. Nick. Nick. Are you asleep? Yes. Good. I want to talk to you. That's jolly. Don't you think you'd like to go back to detect him once in a while just for the fun of it? Can't you get to sleep? No. Everybody says you were a grand detective. They were kidding you. I'd like to see you work. Tomorrow I'll buy you a whole lot of detective stories. Oh, that poor girl's in an awful spot. There's nothing I can do to help her. She thinks you can. It wouldn't hurt you to find out if you could, would it? Well, darling, my guess is that Wynant killed Julia and Dorothy knows it. And the police will catch him without my help. Now, please put out the light. I'm tired. Oh, all right. But I'm mad at you. Uh-huh. Nick. Hmm? Uh-huh. Did you hear a knock? Uh-huh. Shut up, Alfred. You want to answer it, Nick? Oh, good Lord. All right, stay in bed. I'll do it myself. Well? Mr. Charles here. Yes? I got to talk to him right away. What about... What's going on? What's going on? There's someone to see you, Nick. That's great. I was afraid I'd have to go to sleep. Come in. Yeah. Um, how about a chair, Mr. Stay where you are, both of you. I got you covered, so don't move. A stick-up. No, it ain't a stick-up. I got to talk to you, Mr. Charles. I want you to tell me something, and I want you to give it to me straight. You get me? Say, do you mind putting that gun down? Uh, my wife doesn't care, but I'm a very nervous person. Thank you. All right, shoot. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, what's on your mind? You don't need to tell me you're tough. I heard about you. I'm Joe Morelli. I've never heard about you. I didn't bump off Julia. All right, you didn't. I haven't seen her in three months. We were all washed up. Why tell me? Well, I wouldn't have any reason to hurt her. She was always on the up and up with me. But that dirty little rat, Nunheim, well, he got sore because she liked me and hated him. So he put the finger on me. That's all very swell, brother. Only you're peddling your fish in the wrong market. I've had nothing to do with it. Now, listen. The boys used to say that you were okay. A square guy. Now, that's why I'm here. What's the law doing to me? Do they think I did it? Or is it just something else to pin on me? I tell you if I knew, but I'm, in, I'm not in on this. Ask the police. Now, that'd be very smart. The boys would love to have me come in and ask questions. They'd like it right down to the end of their blackjacks. Now, I came to you on the level. The boys say you're on the level. Be on the level. I'm on the level. If I knew anything, I'd... Be... Who's that? I don't know. This is your party. Open up. Open up. Hey, this is the police. The police? You dirty two-timer. Look out, Nora. Oh. Give me that gun. You rat. I'll show you. Yeah. Drop that gun. Drop it. You double cross me, will you? Come on, drop it. Give it to me. Give me the gun. Grab it. Grab it. Let me go. Let me go, I said. I'll take that gun. Thanks, officer. You almost had me. Get some water, Joe. Nora. Are you all right? Nora. I'm Inspector Gill of the Homicide Squad. You're in a good place, Inspector. Who's that woman on the floor? My wife. This guy's shooter? No, he tried to shoot me. I socked her on the jaw to get her out of the line of fire. I guess I hit her too hard. Nora. Oh. Look at me, Nora. Are you all right, darling? Oh. You darn fool. You didn't have to knock me out. I knew you'd take him, but I wanted to see you do it. She's all right. Okay, Slattery. Take Morelli downstairs. Hey, come on, Morelli. Don't push. Come on. I said don't push. 
Todd, you people have to pop in, Inspector. We hear this is getting to be a sort of a meeting place for the Wyman family. So we figured we'd stick around in case the old man himself shows up. Then we seen Morelli sneak in, and we decided to come up. And it was pretty lucky for you, too. Yeah. Morelli, a friend of yours? I never saw him before. What's he want of you? Wanted to tell me he didn't kill Julia Wolf. What's that to you? Nothing. What did he think it was to you? Ask him. I don't know. I'm asking you. Keep on asking. Oh, so you're going to keep mum, huh? All right, Mr. Charles. I won't bother you tonight, but I'll be in tomorrow morning, and I'll have plenty of things to add. Good night. Thank you, Inspector Gill. Next time you come, try to stay longer. Nick, wake up. It's Christmas. Oh, yeah? Look, here's a telegram for you. It just came. Open it, will you? Probably a touch from somebody. Well? Nick. What is it? It's from Clyde Wyman. Listen. Will you take charge of investigation on Julia Wolf murder? Communicate with Herbert McCauley, Clyde Wine. Where's it from? Philadelphia. Then he didn't do it, did he, Nick? I don't know. Communicate with McCauley, huh? All right, we'll ask him up here this morning. There you are, McCauley. What do you think? Hmm. He wants you to handle the case. Yeah. Well, well, what are the chances of you doing it? Slam. Oh, please, Nick. Quiet, dear. I wish you would, Mr. Charles. Uh, uh, Would it help any if I could persuade him to meet you? You might. I had word from Wynne at myself last night. He gave me a code message to insert in the newspapers in case I wanted to get in touch with him. Wouldn't do any harm to put it in. I'm sure you could clear this up. Oh, Wynne, it will only come back. It doesn't look well he's staying away at a time like this. Yes? Oh, oh, just a minute. For you, Mr. McCauley, police department. Police department? Hello? Where? In Allentown. Yes. Well, when's the next train? Right. I'll get that. Well? Wayne has tried to commit suicide. They want him to go down and identify him. Well, I guess this changes the whole story, doesn't it? That looks like an admission of guilt. <laughs> Oh, I had such hopes. I thought if you got on this case... Oh, uh, well. Well, it's no use thinking about it now. Well, I'm sorry to have wasted so much of your time. You'll excuse me, won't you? Of course. Goodbye. Bye. Well, that's that. What's the matter with you? Oh, the mystery's all gone. And I wanted you to find out who did it. Maybe I will. But why not? I don't believe he did it. Why don't you? No reason. That's fine. Right. But I'm going to find out. Come on, Dr. Watson. We're going places. I want to speak to Inspector Gill. Man to man, Mr. Charles. Are you working on this case? Man to man, Inspector Gill, I'm not. But he's interested. I don't mind telling you. I'd rather have you in on the right side. You mean not on Wyman's side? I'd rather have you working with us than against us. So would I. It's a bargain, then. Do you know about the case? I read the papers. What about the suicide? Oh, that's a phony. The men didn't even have to go down. Yeah, I thought it might be. From now on, they're going to think that every thin man over six feet with white hair is whining. Do you think that Wynant did it? It looks like he planned something. He shut up his apartment and his shop. But there's nothing yet to clinch it. Fifty will get you hundreds if Wynant didn't do it. Who's your candidate? I haven't got that far yet. I don't think that everything points to Wynant. What about the alibis? They're all okay. Mrs. Wynant, the boy, Dorothy, Macaulay, even Morelli. Now, what about uh, Jorgens? Hmm? Oh, oh, I'll check on that. <laughs> well, I'm afraid this is kind of dull for you, Mrs. Charles. Dull? I'm sitting on the edge of my chair. Frankly, I'm stunned. I don't know what to do next. What about you, Charles? Me? No, but uh, I've got a hunch. What is it? I got a call last night. I thought it was from a crank. But I've changed my mind. Whoever it was knew something. And I've got a feeling I'll hear from him again. What time is it? Almost ten. Still waiting to hear from the crank? And how? Here, give me that, quick. Hello? Yes? Yes? This is Nick Charles? Who? Can't hear you. I said I can't hear you. 
That speak louder. I, I can't speak any louder. Hey, this is Al Nunheim again. You know, I called you last night. Hey, listen. Are you still interested in that proposition? Yeah, huh? All right, then. Now, here's the dope. And get this straight. The man who killed Julia... <laughs> Gil, you think Weinert killed Julia Wolf and Nunheim? Right. Why? Two reasons. First off, Mimi Weinert came across with a watch chain. She plucked off Julia's body. Oh, she did, huh? It belonged to Clyde Weinert. Yeah. What's the second reason? A pip. The bullet that killed Nunheim came from the same gun. That's all right, Inspector. All right. It's perfect. Clyde Weinert is guilty of both of the murders. Maybe. What? Except you'll still get your hundred. I say Weinert's innocent. You can say what you want. But I'm spreading a dragnet for that guy over every town in these United States. And I'll get him, too. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Cover all roads. Leaving city. Pick up Clyde White and tall thin man. Last seen wearing dark blue suit. Clyde White and tall You think they'll find him, Nick? He must be in New York. He probably is. Oh, it's getting me down. I saw Dorothy today. Yeah? What? She's broken off her engagement. What for? Well, don't ask me. She was a little hysterical. Something about not wanting to ruin her fiancé's life. Daughter of a murderer and all that. Oh, poor kid. Well, see you later, darling. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to take out for a walk. <laughs> He's just been for a walk. We're going sightseeing, aren't we, Esther? <laughs> Nick, what are you up to? I've got a hunch. I'm going down to look at wine and shop. I'm going to find out why it's closed. Well, why shouldn't he close it? He went away. He went away lots of times when I knew him, but he never closed his shop. I've got to hunt something up. You mean he might be hiding there? I don't know, but this thing's got my goat. I've got to find out. Nick, Nick, I won't have you going down there at this hour of the night. He's a crazy man. He might kill you. It'll be all right. I've got Aster to protect me. All right, go on. Go on, see if I care. But it's a dirty trick bringing me all the way to New York just to make me a widow. You wouldn't be a widow long. You bet I wouldn't. Not with all your money. You dog. Goodbye, darling. Mickey, take care of yourself, won't you? Sure I will. Don't say it that way. Say it as if you meant it. Why, I believe that a woman cares. I don't care. I'm just used to you, that's all. Sure. So long, darling. Come on, Esther. Come on, come on. Goodbye. Call me, darling, please. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Esther. Esther, if you let anything happen to him, you'll never wag that tail again. You are listening to the Lux Radio Theater's production of The Thin Man, starring William Powell and Myrna Loy, with the music under the direction of Louis Silver. This is W.S. Van Dyke speaking. We have here tonight the man who wrote the great picture, Lawyer Man, for Bill Powell here. He's a producer, too. But just on the writing end, he's done many great pictures. 42nd Street, The Gold Diggers, King of Burlesque, and lots of others, including an original musical, Ladies in London, which you'll be seeing soon. And here he is, the man whose name you'll see on the screen before the picture starts. One of Hollywood's greatest picture writers, James Seymour. Meet him. Thanks, Woody. I've been a movie writer for ten years. That's the first kind word anybody has said to me. <laughs> Listen, Jim. The average person thinks a movie writer is a fellow that sits by himself at a typewriter, hammer, hammers out a lot of dialogue, and hands it in. Would you like to correct, correct that impression? I certainly would. <clears throat> Nobody works alone and by himself to make a picture. It's a matter of constant cooperation between producer, director, technician, actors, and the writers. Some of the best story ideas come out of the conferences. Jim, how many writers would you say there are on an average picture? Plenty. Believe it or not, I've seen pictures where there were more writers than actors. If all the people who contributed to the story got screen credit, it would look like a page from the telephone directory. Mm -hmm. You've written on both the stage and screen, Jim. Tell the folks how they're different. Well, pictures have less talk, but they tell more in less time. 
Like concentrated foods, all the good and none of the waste. In the theater, everything must be brought to the audience. On the screen, you take your audience wherever the camera can go. And here's another important point that comes right back to your Lux Radio Theater. On the stage, the star just enters. But on the screen, she's introduced with a big close-up. A picture of the star's face many times larger than life-size. Every time a movie star's complexion is mentioned in this Lux Radio Theater, I think of those close-ups. Those stars just have to be beautiful. And they found that Lux Toilet Soap helps them look their best. Producers know it, too. And that's why it's the official soap in all the great studios in Hollywood. Right, Woody? Right on the nose, Jim. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for asking me. Good night. Good night, Jim. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Thin Man. Nick is on his way to Clyde Winant's deserted laboratory. In a dark and desolate section of the city, his cab veers sharply around the corner and pulls up in front of a gloomy, old, rickety building. Say, mister, are you sure this is the place you wanted? Looks like it. Come on, I said jump. How much are you? A dollar twenty. Or do you want me to wait? No, never mind. Oh, that's good. You know, this ain't no neighborhood to be in at two o'clock in the morning. I want to get out of here. There you are. Thanks. Hello. Come on, Arthur. Come on, what's up with you? Hello. Nora, what are you doing here? I beat you down. I want to go with you, Nick. Now, listen. No. You're not going in that place alone, and that settles it. Now get out that skeleton key of yours and open that door. I'm here to stay. All right, come on. Yes. Yeah. Nice neighborhood wine and picked out this laboratory. I can almost hear the chains rattling. Do you believe in ghosts, Nicky? There we are. Come in. Quiet. Nick. Hey, dark in here. Yeah, I've got a flashlight. We might close the door. Shh. Master, shut up. Go on, Nora. Which way? Straight ahead. Can we get the layout of the place? Looks awfully big to me. You can't even see into the corner. We don't let the shadows frighten you. Who's frightened? Now, hold it. What's the matter? This looks like Wynette's work table. More like a slab in a morgue. Look, Nick. There's a cement floor all around. Yeah, there's probably a lot of weight goes on that table. Come on. Where to now? There's an old desk over there on the wall. I want to take a look at it. What do you expect to find? Darling, if I knew what I'd find, I wouldn't be... Nick. What's like it, Nick? Just a loose board, I guess. It, it, it sounds like, like somebody was walking over that way. Oh, just your imagination. There's no one in here but us. No? What about why not? The Sears workshop. Why couldn't he be hiding out here? What's that? It's Asta. Asta, come here. He's scratching on the cement around the work table. Asta, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Did you hear what I said, Asta? Nick, look at him. He's after something. I've seen him scratch the ground like that when, when, when he was looking for... Shh! Asta! Asta! Nora, look. Look at this. New cement, listen. Nick. It's hollow. I wonder if I could find something to dig it up. There's an iron bar on the table I just saw. Really? Ah, good. Now, if I can snap a hole in that cement... Find out what's under there. Oh, Nick, I'm scared. <laughs> Ask the quiet. You can keep away, Nora. Ask to come here. Uh, once more. Uh, there she goes. Ah, uh, uh, I'm through the cement. Nick. <laughs> Ask to get away from there. Get away. Whew. Nick, what is it? What's he after? We must get Inspector Gill here. What's under there? A body. Must have been there for weeks. Wait a minute. Wait now, you reporters. You'll get your story as soon as I can give it to you. Until then, you got to leave your phone. Come on now, get out. Those reporters are enough to drive a guy nuts. 
Well, you were right, Nick. It was a body. A skeleton, rather, buried in lime. I wonder what Wayne had against this one. Did you find any clothes? Yeah, but no identification on them. Just a silver belt buckle with the initials DWR. DWR. Who is that? I got a good idea. That case you worked on, the guy who threatened to kill Wynan. What was his name? Oh, uh, Rosewater. Yeah, Rosewater. He said Wynan tried to steal an invention, didn't he? Yes, but we figured it was just blackmail. Just the same, Wynan wouldn't mind having him out of the way, would he? And according to the doc, the body's been there at least a couple of months. Hmm. That's just about the time Wynan closed the shop. Right. Did you put the skeleton under the fluoroscope yet? Half an hour ago. We found the bullet he was killed with, and something in the leg bone. An old piece of shrapnel. Shrapnel? Yeah. Why? Shrapnel in the leg bone. He probably limped. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Well, so long, Inspector. I'm going to pick up my wife, take her home. It's been a long night. So long. Give her my best, will you? Right. Where are we going, Nick? Back to the hotel, my sweet. Pack our bags and take a nice trip somewhere. A trip? Oh, no. My soul, woman. I give you three murders and you aren't satisfied. I want you to stay and find one. I did find it. What do you mean? He was down in the shop. Nick. It was his body that was buried there. Wyman's body? Yeah. But they all said it was Rosewater. Oh, that's what they think. What makes you so sure it's Wyman's body? Several things. Clothes, for instance. They were carefully preserved. They were carefully preserved. And the body was just carefully destroyed. The person that killed him counted on one thing, that all skeletons look alike. Well, don't they? Sure. But I remember that Wynette had some shrapnel in his shin. They found it under the fluoroscope. How long has he been dead? A couple of months, anyway. Then he couldn't have committed those other murders. Smart guy. Wynette did. Did Dorothy know? No, nobody but you. I didn't even tell Gil. Why not? I want to lie low till I get the whole dope. I don't want to go off our cock. What are you going to do? I'm going to get the real murderer. I've got an idea. Want to see me take him? Yes. Yeah. You got a nice evening dress? Oh, I've got a loser. Why? I'm going to have a party, a dinner party. Everything from Russian caviar to camembert cheese. An orchestra behind the palm, the dude lighting. What is this? And I'm going to invite all of the suspects. The suspects? They won't come. Oh, no, they'll come. I'll have Gil issue the invitation. Nick, who's going to be here? Everybody. You, me, Dorothy, Eric, fiancé, uh... Hey, his name's Andy. Uh, right. Macaulay, Mimi, Gilbert, Jorgerson, and Morelli. Oh, darling, what a lovely party. Good evening, everybody. Mr. Charles, what is the meaning of this? The meaning of what, Mimi? Why, were we all rounded up like common criminals and brought to the sitter? Yes, to eat, Mimi, and talk. Will everyone please be seated? Dorothy here. Thank you. Andy, next to her, please. Oh, but Mr. Charles, please. Please? Very well. Mimi, on the other side of Andy. Yes. Uh, Mr. Jorkson, over there, please. Very kind, Mr. Charles. Not at all. Mr. McCauley, next. Of course. Morelli? What? Right where you are. Now, say, listen. Sit down. Uh... And, uh, Gilbert, uh, you can sit just opposite Mama. Mr. Charles, I have a theory. Uh, we'll listen to it later. Uh, Inspector Gill, you and your men will stand by, uh, by the door, please. Sure. Fine. Now, Nora, if you'll sit here by me. Delighted, Mr. Charles. A pleasure, Mr. Charles. Now, we're all ready to begin. Uh, will you please pass the celery, Mrs. Ryan? No, I will not. I demand to know why we are here. Before dinner? All right. I've got some important news. I've seen Wynan. You've seen Mama? Uh, level. What? What? Certainly, I mean it. That's nothing. I saw him myself. Yes, Mimi? When? Last night. He came to see me in my apartment. Oh, did he? What did he say? He didn't say very much. He wanted to know how I was and how the children were. I'm afraid you're lying, Mimi. <gasps> you see, I really did see wine at last night. Are you kidding? No. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you hold him? Because I found out for certain that he didn't commit the murders. Well, you know that that's ridiculous. Now, wait a minute. Let him have his say. Thank you. Morelli, you knew Julia... Was she jipping Wynant? Taking dough on the fly? Well, she don't say she is, but I figure she is, yeah. Thank you. Now I'll tell you why I know Wynant didn't commit those murders. Three months ago, Wynant found out that Julia was cheating him and was splitting with some man. He went to find the man, and he did. That man was desperate. He knew that he was caught dead to rights. 
And at prison, staring him in the face, he took the only way out. He killed Wynett. Oh. Terrible to tell you this way, Dorothy, that your father's dead. Dead? He's been dead for three months. Dead? Oh. Oh, darling, don't cry. Oh. oh I know it's terrible, but isn't it really better this way? Oh, Andy. Andy. You'd better take her home, Andy. Yes, of course. Come on, darling. Let them out, Inspector. Oh, open up. Oh, don't cry, darling, please. It'll be all right now. Oh, oh, take care of it. Oh, this is absurd. How can Clyde be dead? You said yourself you saw him last night. So I did. I saw him lying buried in his shop. You mean that body? It was Wynant. Perfectly absurd. And the murderer is right here in this room tonight. He's sitting at this table. What? Who is it? I don't know. But I thought if we all had a little get-together, we might be able to find out. I'll tell you as much as I know. This murderer is a very clever man. He planned the whole thing beautifully. After he killed Wynant, he wired Macaulay, using Wynant's name, and told him to shut up the shop. Then he took Wynant's body and buried it in the shop with another man's clothes to throw us off the track. He even put a belt buckle with an R on it, hoping that we'd think it was Rosewater, an old enemy of Wynant who dropped out of sight years ago. From Rally. Yes? Yeah. Would you mind holding your knife the other way? You're worrying Gilbert. Oh, I see. Yes. If that knife is missing, I'll look for it in your back. I'll help you look. Uh, well, after our hero had killed Wynett, he got a brilliant idea. He realized that he and Julia could still collect money. Wynett was supposed to be on a trip. No one knew where. So our dinner guest wrote letters to Macaulay, signing Wynett's name, so that Macaulay would continue to send the money to Julia. He even telephoned Macaulay. Uh, do you remember Macaulay? The first day that you came to see me, he telephoned that he was in town. Oh, it must have been Wynett. I should have known if it weren't his voice. Oh, he was clever about that. He called when you were out. Now, that same afternoon, Julia telephoned him. She said that you were coming, Mimi, to ask about Wynett. He got terrified. He was afraid that Julia would break down and tell. So he went to Julia and killed her. And left Wynant's watch chain in her hand. Maybe what is the story about that? I don't know. I don't know. Julia, it makes sense. I hope you're aware. Quiet, please. His plan was still working beautifully. The only hitch was a man named Nunheim who had found out something. So our hero bumped him off, too. But our hero overlooked just one item. The telegrams, wires, and telephones were all very well. But no one had seen Wynant. So the murderer picked on poor Mimi here to strengthen his case. Mimi is the only one at this table who can tell us who the real murderer is. Mimi? Who was it told you to say you'd seen Wynett? Nobody told me. I did see him. What did he pay you, Mimi, to stick to that story? It isn't a story. It's true. I did see Wynett. He's not dead. You're lying, Mimi. But then you do anything for money. You're getting a good price for saying you saw Wynett. I'm not going to stay here and be insulted. Sit down. You're getting a good price, Mimi. But don't forget this. Two other people were in with him on this deal. Julia and Nunheim. When he thought they might spill something, he bumped them off. You ought to know darn well that he's not going to take any chances on you. What do you want to do, be next on his list? No, no. Then who is he? Who paid you that money? Macaulay. Oh, oh, Macaulay, you dirty little... No, no. I think that'll hold him. Oh, boy, oh, boy, what a wallet. Hey, nice work, Mr. Charles. There's your man, Inspector. Mr. Macaulay. I can't believe it. What do you want me to do, wrap him up in cellophane? Take him up and get him out of here. Come on, boys. Grab him. Let me get a hand on him. Nick, you took him. I knew you would. Yeah, another case like this, and I'll have a little prize fight there. Oh, Nicky, you're grand. You're glorious. I bet you say that to all the boys. Story of the Thin Man with William Powell and Myrna Loy. I'm going to get them back out here in a minute to talk to you. As you know, these broadcasts from the Lux Radio Theater are quite an event in Hollywood. And among our many friends here tonight is one of the greatest stars of the silent pictures. I admired her from afar when she was doing such magnificent spectacles as Cleopatra. And I was just an extra. Today, she is the wife of one of our leading film directors. I've known her for many years as a most charming and gracious lady. And I want you to meet her now, Miss Theda Barrett.
Thank you, Woody. Uh, Hollywood entertainment has certainly developed amazingly since I was making pictures. Yes, everything's different now. As you and I know, uh. before pictures grew up and started to talk, we had to translate all emotion into pantomime. Oh, you may think you have trouble today, but do you remember the difficulties we had working with a split screen? We had to express jealousy, hate, love, or devotion, all in pantomime. And at the same time, keep pace as the director guided us with a one, two, three, four, just as a metronome guides a pianist. Pantomime has always been one of the greatest of arts. And may I say, Miss Vera, I've always thought that you were one of the greatest masters of that art. Oh, you're very kind, Woody. We worked awfully hard making those pictures. For instance, in making Cleopatra, we had no research department at the studio. I worked myself for months with the curator of Egyptology at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It's great fun, though. I understand, Miss Vera, you're going to make some radio appearances. Yes, I am. Oh. And I'm also going to do some motion picture work. Oh, that's good news. I'm considering an offer now, running through scripts and ideas. Oh, I just hope everyone will be as happy about another fruit of our picture as I am. The public has been very good to me in the past. And I know they'll be awfully glad to see you again. I'm sure it'll be a great thrill not only seeing you, but hearing your voice. Thanks, Miss Sarah, for joining us tonight. I'm glad I could. Good night. Hearing Theda Barrett talk of her plans brings to my mind some other plans I've heard discussed in Hollywood this week. Picture people are talking about Charlie Chaplin's recent statement that he will start work on a new picture very shortly. Miss Paulette Goddard will be starred. Chaplin will write and direct, but will not act in it. A disappointment to many of us. Barbara Stanbrick and Robert Taylor are starting a new picture today, and I'm tickled to death that I got the job directing. <clears throat> it's called His Brother's Wife. Speaking of Bob Taylor, there's a lad who is going places. He's got a great future. And sometime in that future, he's going to do Armand to Greta Garbo's Camille. Bill Powell and Myrna Loy here are interested in the making of MGM's picture, The Good Earth. Louise Rayner, who is with them in the great Ziegfeld, and Paul Muni of the stars. And now Bill Powell and Myrna Loy are coming out on the stage. Arise, Bill. Myrna. <laughs> Kids, you did a great show. You're really marvelous. What, no retakes? <laughs> no, no property man. Yeah, Bill. I'll bet you're glad my property man isn't here. Remember how he used to swatch you with a broomstick when you weren't hurrying on the set fast enough? Yes, that Harry Alvarez is a great fellow. He's the most independent of in the whole picture business. Listen, Bill, that fellow was with me in the Arctic when we made Eskimo. He was with me in African jungle when we made Trader Horn. And after a man has handled crocodiles, sharks, pythons, and polar bears, you can't expect him to be afraid of a mere actor. Yeah, there's, there's only one thing I can ever understand about that picture, uh, Eskimo, Woody. How did they tell you from the polar bears? He wore rubbers. I wore a hat. <laughs> <laughs> must be pretty tough, Woody, when you have to plow through swamps, jungles, <laughs> tropics, and the Arctic. I suppose when you call up and say you're going on location, your wife says, uh, oh, yes, location. Do you want the snowshoes or the snake bite medicine? Mm. Unfortunately, she doesn't say that. When I say I'm going on location, she just says, uh, you are not. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, I thought all about that traveling, uh, I thought all about it when the Lux Soap people asked me to do this broadcast. Isn't it funny? In the Arctic, soap is something they like to eat. In the tropics, they use soap for money. And here in Hollywood, soap is something that keeps the stars beautiful. Now, I can see that it keeps Myrna beautiful, Woody, but, uh, when are you going to start using that? Nice talk, soap? nice talk. <laughs> <laughs> what I do use is that. And that's no kidding. Anyway, thanks for coming up, kid. Goodbye, Woody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Before I tell you about next week's show, I'm going to ask our announcer, Mr. Rick, to tell you about more about the cast and about Hollywood Studios who are cooperating with us. Our cast of characters tonight, Nick, William Powell, Nora, Myrna Loy, Mimi, Minagondo, Macaulay, Porter Hall, Dorothy, Barbara Luddy, Gilbert, William Henry, Chris Jorgensen, Brett Morrison, Julia Wolf, Margaret Brayton, Inspector Guild, Thomas Jackson, Morelli, Wally Mayer, Nunheim, Ernie Adams. Our director, W.S. Van Dyke, and our stars, William Powell and Myrna Loy, appeared through courtesy of Metro-Golden-Mayer, as did Mr. William Henry and Porter Hall through the courtesy of Paramount. The musical director of this program, Mr. Louis Silvers, appears through the kindness of 20th Century Fox. And now, here is your producer, Mr. W.S. Van Dyke. 
thanks to all of you in the cast. You did a swell job. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, the Lux Radio Theater is going to have a great show for you. And believe me, Al Jolson and Ruby Keeler are going to be here to appear in burlesque. It was a smash hit on Broadway and then a great moving picture. And now it's going to make a marvelous radio vehicle for Al Jolson and Ruby Keeler. I think you'll like it. <laughs> DeMille will return to the Lux Radio Theater in time to, to produce Burlesque. And you know he'll give you a great show. I've enjoyed being with you all, and good night. Columbia Broadcasting System. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. This is security police headquarters. We've just seen the photo print and it's impossible. I said impossible. No matter what the evidence proves, no man can be two places at once. 2,000 plus. Science fiction adventures in the world of tomorrow. 2,000 plus presents The Other Man. <laughs> Darling, you home? Hey, when I come home, I want my wife to be here. Mary Ann here. Hey, didn't you hear me? Scotty! Oh, my darling! Oh, Scotty! Scotty! Mary, have, have a say, what's the matter? When did you escape? How did you get away? Escaped? Would you mind telling me? Shh! You? Quiet. I thought I heard someone. Just a moment, darling. There now. We can talk. Oh, Scotty, I couldn't understand what had happened to you. 
I was so worried. I, I couldn't believe it. Mira, I hate to stand here like an idiot. I just can't go on repeating your silly phrases after you. What are you talking about? Then you didn't kill the man in the blue turban? Where was I supposed to have killed him? In Cairo. Cairo? When? This morning. Look, darling, I know this is the year 2000 plus 120, but even in this age of super science, there's no jet plane fast enough to fly me from Cairo, Egypt, to Metropolitan City, USA that fast. Scotty, I'm telling you the truth. Look, I'll show you. It's all over the front pages of this facsimile newspaper. See? There, the whole story in headlines. And your picture, too. Read it. Read it. The World Security Police in a daring action in Cairo, Egypt, today captured Scott Douglas, chief of the Eastern Zone Security Police Section, as the chief criminal behind a worldwide black market operation running into millions of dollars annually. In the struggle preceding his arrest, Mr. Douglas shot and killed a mysterious stranger wearing a blue turban. You see, darling, it is true. Not only in the papers, but all day in the Televox News. I've seen it, Scotty, with my own eyes. Being taken to the police, to the, to the airport, it was you, Scotty. I tell you, this is not true. It's not me. Look, call my office. Ask for the chief. Ask him what this is all about. They know you've escaped. They'll come here. To, they'll capture you They won't again. do any such thing because none of it's true. Look, if you're worried about it, don't tell him I'm here. If he asks you, deny it. But for heaven's sake, call him. All right, Scotty. All right. Mr. Enright? Hello, Mira. I was rather expecting you to call. You want to know about Scotty, don't you? I can't understand it, Mr. Enright. I've seen it in the papers on the telebox, but I can't believe I'm it. I'm afraid it's true, Mira. But are you certain it's Scotty? There's no doubt of it. But how do you know? By the obvious methods. It looks like Scotty. It talks like Scotty. It's wearing Scotty's clothes, carrying Scotty's wallet with your picture and his private papers in it. The small birthmark on the left arm, same blood type, same fillings in the teeth. And the fingerprints are exactly Scotty's. I had everything double-checked by audio from Egypt against Scotty's personal identification file here. And to top it all off, Mira, I talked to him by audio phone just a few minutes before the jet plane took off. I'm sorry. Huh. I see. Thank you, Mr. Enright. Oh, just one thing more, Mira. Yes? Scotty is due to land in about three hours. I'll send someone over in a little while to pick you up. I know you'll want to see him. Thank you. Thank you. It's unbelievable. It's fantastic. Mira, I... Who are you? Who are you? Who am I? I'm your husband. I'm Scott Douglas. I'm going to call the police. Oh, stop it. I am Scotty. Look at me, Mira. I am your husband. No one can fool you about that. Look at me. Good Lord, Mira, look, look. Look, here's my wallet. The one he talked about, see? It is mine. You know it, look. Touch it, thumb through it. There's a picture. There's the stitching where I had it repaired last October. Remember, Mira, when I didn't want to throw it away for sentimental reasons because we bought it that night last summer at the Little Bazaar? Who would know that, Mira, except your husband? Who would remember that except me? Here, look at this. Pull my sleeve up. The birthmark on my left arm. Nobody could fake that ugly thing. You know that mark, every twist of it. Uh, uh, fingerprints, fingerprints. I I'll give you all you want. Have them checked any way you want. I am Scott Douglas. I am your husband. Then who... Who is the other man? <laughs> Police, Scotty. They're here to pick me up. And take you to the airport to meet your husband. Oh, Scotty, I'm frightened. You must never let anyone know that. It's the only way I'll ever be able to figure this thing out. I I'll try, darling. Uh, just a moment, I'm coming. Oh, darling. Now, remember, this whole thing may be a trick. I don't know why or for what reason, but there's always the possibility that this was a deliberate deception. But they can't fool they me. They did fool you, Mir Mira. They, you believed all the publicity, all the newspaper reports, everything you saw on the telebox. That's what I can't understand. This whole thing's being carried out so openly, so boldly. 
They act as if they're so sure of themselves. I, I, I've got to go now. They'll be suspicious. Yes, yes. Now, remember our plan. Yes. After you leave, I'll get out of here. I don't know where I'll go, but I'll get in touch with you from time to time. You'll always know it's me and not the other man because I'll use the code word bizarre. I know, darling. You don't have to tell me again. All right. And act toward this other man as if he really were me. At least do that for a while. It's obviously what they expect of you. Yes, yes, Scotty. You've told me a dozen times. I, I, I know what to do. Oh, goodbye, darling. Yes, what is it? Plane from Cairo with Douglas aboard coming in, sir. Okay. Over here, Mira. We can see the plane land from this window. It'll be landing over there by that ramp. Who are those men? Security police. I'm sorry, Mira, but we can't take any chance of Scotty escaping. We've taken great care ever since his arrest. Yeah, the plane's coming in now. Taxi. I wonder what... What he'll look like. A little tired, perhaps, but it's Scotty. I told you that. Well, the plane stopped. You'll see him in a moment, Mira. Now, look, when he comes in here, don't break down. He's going to need all the courage and help you can give him. There, look. It... It does look like Scotty. Well, yes? Prisoner's coming up, sir. Bring him in the moment he arrives. Yes, sir. Do you like a drink, Mira? No, no, no thanks. Cigarette? Nothing, please. Oh, here they are. All right, men, outside. Leave Douglas with me. Okay, sir. Hello, Scotty. Hello, Chief. Hello, Mira. Hello? Uh, I think I'll, uh... Look, I'll leave you two alone for a while. Thanks, Chief. I'm glad you're here, Mira. I was wondering if you would be. Were you? Mira, what's the matter? You're so cold, so distant. Darling, I, I don't understand. Don't you want to talk to me, Mira? I don't know. I'm... I don't know. It's all been a terrible shock to you, hasn't it? What did you learn? Did the chief call you? No. I, I first learned through the newspaper, then the telebox. You mean it's it's been published, broadcast? Good Lord, everybody knows then. That's right. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. I hardly know what happened myself. The last few days are a blur, a, a blank. All I remember is a room in a hotel in Cairo, a man with a blue turban, the police. I became panic-stricken. There was a fight, a shot, and then the arrest. And the talk about the black market. I don't know what that means. Mary, you look so strange. For heaven's sake, what's the matter? Don't touch me! Don't touch you? I'm your husband. Oh, you're not my oh, husband. Oh, darling, darling. I, I can't pretend. You're not Scotty. You're not. I'm... I'm not Scotty. Now, Mira, stop this hysteria at once. What do you mean, I'm not Scotty? It's a trick. It's a cruel hoax. I think you're serious. Call them in. Tell them I know. Mira, what have they done to you? Said to you? I could ask you those questions. And I could also ask you, who are you? Who am... This is crazy. Let me see your birthmark. What? All right, look. It's me, Dolly. You know that's real. But I... I... Let me see the wallet. You mean this? There it is. Your picture. Even the stitching I had done when I wouldn't throw it away. You remember, darling? It is the wallet. It... It looks just like it. What did you expect? Well, they could fake it. They have ways. A wallet could be faked. Look, Mira, I don't understand all this. But I am your husband. I am Scotty. Let me prove it to you. Ask me anything about us, anything. Oh, where did we go last summer? To Paris for two weeks. We stayed at the Hotel George V. What did we do when we first got there? We opened the window and sang a silly song about Paris. We made it up as we went along. And then, and then I kissed you. We were alone. No one could have seen. We went out, had a drink. You ordered champagne in the afternoon. The waiter tried to talk you out. Stop you. it! Stop it! I don't know how you know these things. You seem to be Scotty, and, and yes. Oh, 
darling, they can't darling. Be. I, I saw you only a few hours ago. And oh. But I was on the plane. You saw that. You were home. home. All right, all right, darling, if you say so. I take it easy, honey. Don't cry. Don't, don't. There, now, if you say Scotty was at home, then that's where I was. Home. Home. <laughs> Got the reports from Cairo, Chief. Complete? As complete as they'll ever be. They just came in via high-frequency telebox, and we have photo prints made. Here they are. Never mind. Just give me the highlights. Well, the man in the blue turban was Mustafa Cornelius. He made his living in art, sold pictures and things. What was he doing in Scotty's room? Oh, probably picking up some stuff. You know, the place was filled with pictures. Yeah, and Scotty said he doesn't know how they got there. He said that even when we showed him Egyptian police reports that he and Mustafa had been followed for two days. And on several occasions, Scotty was carrying pictures himself. So he was lying. No, he wasn't. We gave him a lie detector test and he came through 100%. I didn't know that. But it's true. And why was Scotty in Cairo anyway? He had no orders to go there. How do you explain that? He didn't. He said he couldn't remember. This is one for the books. Sounds like two other guys. That's not so funny. What do you mean that's not so funny? When Scotty got off the plane and came in here, I turned on the intercom and left him and Mirror together. I listened to their conversation from the outer office. Learn anything? I don't know. Except that Mira seemed to doubt it was Scotty. Now, now, wait a minute. It was Scotty. I know it was Scotty, and you know it was Scotty. But why wouldn't Scotty's own wife know it was Scotty? I don't know. I don't either. Two other guys, huh? Well, we know that the Scotty who got off the plane is safely locked up in this building. You and I are going to see his wife and try to figure this puzzle out. Come on. Hello, Mira. Mr. Enright. I want to talk to you. Now close the door, Paul. Right. You, 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 you shouldn't have come here. Why not? I have some questions to ask you. I'm expecting someone. Please go. It'll only take a few minutes, Mira. I want to help Scotty, but I can't do it alone. I'll come to your office. But the chief wants some answers now, Mrs. Douglas. Oh, then come in here. Thanks. When my visitor comes, I must ask you to stay in here. Of course. I'm sorry to have disturbed you like this, but there are some very strange things about this matter. Strange? What do you mean, strange? Why didn't you believe that was Scotty in my office? Then he told you that he isn't Scotty. He told me nothing. I listened in. And it was Scotty. It's the Scotty I know. Now, why don't you believe that? That's one of the things that puzzles me. One of the strange things. Where's Scotty now? That's your doorbell. The person you're expecting. Where's Scotty He's now? He's at the detention house in a cell. Why aren't you answering the door? Uh, you stay here. Uh, please stay here until I get back. Chief, she's as nervous as a radioscope. Shh, quiet. Put your ear to the door and listen. Hello, darling. Hello, Scott. It's a man. Can't make out what they're saying. Something vaguely familiar. Oh, no, it can't be. What do you mean, Chief? Take your gun. All right, now, just don't move. Hello, Chief. Mary was just telling me you were here. Scotty, I don't know how you did it, but escaping from detention is a very serious... I effect. didn't escape. I've never been there. I've never been to Cairo. I don't know what's going on, Enright, but I'm glad you're here, so this whole mess can be cleared Just up. Just don't move, Scotty. Get on the audio phone, Paul. Yes, sir. Call headquarters, have them check on Scotty. Right. Scotty, you and I have been friends for ten years. Now, what kind of a game are you playing? I don't think friends hold a gun. But what do you want me to do, let you get away again? Mr. Enright, I told Mira, you... you're as mixed up as I am. Admit it. You see, Scotty, I overheard the conversation you and Mira had at headquarters. But I wasn't Let's there. Let's not argue about it. We'll know in a moment. Hey, Chief... Yes, what is it? I talked to headquarters, Chief. Well? Scotty, you're still there in a cell. What? Still there? Now, wait a minute. That's what they said. Get them to put Scotty on the phone. Yes, sir. We'll get to the bottom of this pretty quickly now. Put Let's Scotty. go into the other room. Come on. Yeah, the Chief wants to talk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all right. Hold the line. The chief wants to talk to you. Here he is. Keep them covered. Hello? Yes, Chief. That you, Scotty? Yes, sir. I just wanted to be sure. Chief, what on earth is going on? You don't have to 
talk to me to be sure. Not when you've got me locked in a cell that dynamite couldn't blow up. Okay, over. Scotty. Scotty. Who are you talking to? To Scott Douglas, who got off the plane from Cairo this morning. But I'm Scott Douglas. Chief, have you seen Mira? I want to talk to her again. Just hang on a moment. Now, just repeat after me. I am Scott Douglas of the World Security Police. Now, look, you... Oh, all right. I am Scott Douglas of the World Security Police. Okay, let's hear you say that. Chief, are you crazy? Say what I tell you. I am Scott Douglas of the World Security Police. They sound exactly alike. Now what do I do, sing Mother McCree? What you do is what you've been doing all day. You wait for me in your cell. And you're coming along with me. What are you going to do? Mrs. Douglas, I'm going to take you and your husband to meet your husband. He's out here, Chief. Bring him in. Mira, Scotty, you stand over there. All right, Chief. Now, once and for all, tell... Mira. Oh, darling, I'm glad... Good Lord. Mr. Enright, I... I can't believe it. It's absolutely incredible. He looks just like me. What is this, Chief? What is... Have either of you two ever seen each other before? Every morning in the mirror. What kind of a gag is it? Now, be quiet, both of you. Yes, Chief. Have you got those reports? About two minutes. Let me know. Now, one of you two is an imposter. I will say this. The resemblance is fantastic. You, the one we had in the cell. We got your fingerprints, teeth identifications, birthmark, and so on when you were arrested. They all verified that you are the real Scott Douglas. I've told you that all along. I'm Scott Douglas. Chief, whatever is going on We'll know who you are in a few minutes. We'll have the results of the fingerprint and identification check we had you take before I brought Scotty up from downstairs. Yes? I've got the report, Chief. Well? Everything checks, sir. Now, come on, talk sense, will you? What do you mean, everything checks? Fingerprints, teeth identification, birthmarks, everything checks, sir. They're both Scott Douglas. All right. Now, remember, don't interrupt me. The only way I can tell you two apart is by the clothes you wear. You... You're wearing a tropical suit, the one you had on when we picked you up in Cairo. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to call you Tropical. And you with the Tweed, that's your name, Tweed. Is that clear? Right, Chief. The last two hours of questioning has revealed that the memory of your lives is exactly the same up to four days ago. Whatever questions you were asked separately, you both answered the same. Intimate questions, family questions, every kind. But as of four days ago, the police interrogators report that you, Tropical... You are hazy, almost blank, until the arrest and murder in Cairo. That's right, sir. On the other hand, you, Tweed, you have a clear memory except for a few hours three days ago. Now, here, let me read it. Pursuant to file 198, I was ordered to visit a Mr. David Eitner, suspected of dealing in black market paintings at 223 West 18th Street, and to pose as a buyer of rare paintings. Mr. Eitner conducted himself in a reasonable and normal manner and exhibited several paintings, allegedly genuine old masters. During our conversation, I heard a faint oscillating sound in the room and inquired whether it was the air conditioning unit. And then I blacked out. Now, at this point, your two memories separate. You both remember everything up to the moment Scott Douglas blacked out. But after that, Tweed's memory does not pick up until two hours has passed. Then he reports... The next thing I knew, I awoke lying on the floor. I thought I had been slugged, but subsequent examination by police medical authority showed no injury of any sort. The assumption was that I had fainted, but no reason for this possibility was advanced. The paintings, together with Mr. Eitner, were nowhere to be found when I regained consciousness. Subsequent police investigation failed to reveal any trace of Mr. Eitner or his paintings. So, there it is. And you, Tropical... You remember nothing for the next several days until we picked you up in Cairo. I remember that report very well. I wrote it. But he couldn't have known about the first part of that report. I went alone. No one else. I was there. That was my report. Stop it, you two. It's bad enough seeing double without you two talking double and remembering double. Two hours. Two hours. What happened in those two hours? Chief, I've got an idea. What is it? Probably nothing to it after three days, but why don't we visit 223 West 18th Street again? 
Let's see whether Mr. Eitner possibly left something behind when he fled with the paintings. This is the place. Looks pretty empty now. This is where he had several old paintings hanging on the wall. This is where I was standing when I blacked out. That's right, Chief. I walked over there from here and then it happened. What's that? That sound. Keep him over there. That closet. Come on. Come out of there. Come out or I'll shoot. Do not shoot, Sahib. No, do not kill me. Who are you? Do not kill me, Sahib. What are you doing here in this room? Talk. Talk. Do not kill me, Sahib. I beg you. If you don't talk, I make no promises. I have children. I have a wife. And I've got a gun. Well? If I talk, you let me live. Talk. I come to destroy the instrument. What instrument? It is in here, Sahib. The instrument of Mustafa Cornelius. The man in the blue turban. I swear to come back and destroy it if he ever died. It is built into this closet behind this secret panel. It make Mustafa and me very rich. Let's see that instrument. Open the panel. Looks like a control board. What does it do? I do not know the words to describe it. Only Mustafa knew because he was very wise and very scientific. You know how to operate this? Oh, yes, Sahib. Mustafa showed me what to do, and I work long hours doing that, for I was both becoming very rich. Show us what it does. And remember, if any danger results, this man has a gun. You'll be the first to die. I understand, Sahib. Give me something for the instrument. What do you mean, give you something? I tried to explain. Give me something, a picture, perhaps... There are no pictures here. Then a ring, perhaps a watch, or a shoe, uh, a dog, anything. Does this make any sense? Play along with him, Chief. Here, here's a ring and a watch. Thank you, Sahib. I place them in here and close this small door. I turn on the instrument... That's the sound. The sound I heard. He's right, Chief. The sound before I blacked out. Now, what do you do? A moment until the bell sound. It is finished. Now, you see. There are now two watches, two rings. Let me see them. Great dynamos of Niagara, they're exactly alike. Even to the scratches, the the dirt marks, everything. Let me see them. You're right. Identical. Perfect copies. No, no, Sahib. They are not copies. All are original. But that can't be. The ones I gave you were the originals. The others are the copies. That's right. Uh, just a minute, Chief. Look at this marking. Molecular duplicator. What did you say? Molecular duplicator? That's right. That means that somehow... Well, it's possible theoretically, but it means that the molecules and atoms of the originals are perfectly duplicated. And we know that if somehow the atoms and molecules could be exactly arranged, you'd actually have two originals, where only one existed before. Yes, yes, Sahib. That is what Mustafa say. Those are the words that I do not know how to use. All right, now listen to me, you desert rat. Does this machine work on anything other than inanimate objects? None. I do not understand, Sahib. Does it work on living things, dogs, birds? Human beings? It has worked on a dog, Sahib. Mustafa, he had a dog he liked so much. He make himself another dog like it with this instrument. Then... And it would work on human beings, too. But the dog, one of them, I do not know which one of them, the dog, he died very horribly, Sahib. 
What do you mean? Died horribly. One day, about a month after the first dog become two dog, one day, the dog bark and whine. It is in agony, Sahib. And before my eyes, it... I, I do not know how to say. It, it is disappear slowly, as if it fall apart. And in a little while, there is nothing left. Nothing. Molecular disintegration. On living flesh, the effect of the machine lasts only a limited time. Chief. Which one of us? Him? Or me? Which one of us is Scott Douglas? Next week, 2000 Plus presents another exciting melodrama from the world of tomorrow. For thrilling, for thrillers that are different, join us again next week and every week. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions, Incorporated. In today's cast, Ralph Bell portrayed Scotty, Joan Shea was Mira, Nat Poland was the chief, and Gilbert Mack was the Arab. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Sound, Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner. Engineer, Ed Formica. This is Ken Marvin speaking. Thousand Plus is a regular presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. 
Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. From Hollywood, Lyle Talbot in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. And now, Lyle Talbot, famous motion picture and stage star in Cargo Unknown, a drama of the unexpected. My dear Lorna, no, dear Mrs. Andrews, yeah, that's better, comma, you'll no doubt remember me, you should, I'm the long, lean, wide-eyed lad you approached, I think that's the word. Approached that sticky afternoon in the bar at Ginger's. You were looking your best. Black hair on white shoulders and not too much of a salmon pink dress. So I turned around and stared. After all, deep sea diving is a lonely business. Do you buy me a drink or do I buy you one? That depends on whether I'm a gentleman or not. Well, are you? That depends on you. Mike, give us a couple of the same. Okay, coming up. Now, uh, do we use names? It's simple. I'm Lorna Andrews. Here's to you, Lorna. Here's to you, Tom. Oh? Yes, I know your name. I've been following you. That wasn't necessary. I want to talk to you about business. Before pleasure? Uh-huh. I hear you're the guy I've been looking for. Offhand, I'd say you were right. I hope so, Tommy. Because there's a lot of money waiting for us. For you and me. An awful lot. How much? Enough. In round figures, over two million. I like round figures. When do we go after it? That depends on where it is. About 175 feet down. That's pretty deep. Oh, you look like a big, strong boy, Tom. You can get it. 175 feet is a lot of water, especially when you're under it. I wouldn't know. But they tell me you're the only diver in Honolulu who could make it. Better give me the whole picture, Lorna. All right. You fit up a boat, we take a little sail, and then you go swimming. Where? Uh, I'll let you know when we get there. Not till then? Uh-uh. Sorry, Lorna. What's the matter? I don't buy it. I'm not a very legitimate guy, but I like to do legitimate business. Makes for nice contrast. What's wrong with this setup? Plenty. If there was that much money lying around, somebody else would be after it. 
probably insurance or shipping companies. So you're either looking for something you shouldn't have or just lying. I'd like it better if you were lying. It's the truth, Tom. Okay, have it your way. But a woman like you ought to have more important things to lie about than money. So long, Lorna. And thanks for the drink. So I walked out on you, Mrs. Andrews, and right into the grinning face of our mutual friend, Mr. Comar. Mrs. Andrews is an interesting woman, isn't she, Mr. Stevenson? Does she interest you? No, not exactly. But I, too, am concerned with the matter of the Mary Arnold. The who? Oh, as usual, women are so secretive, and it is so unnecessary. Mary Arnold is a ship now lying off Molokai Reef. Everyone knows she is there. Yeah, then what's the secret? Her cargo, Mr. Stevenson. Her cargo. Now you begin to interest me, Mr... Uh... Coma. Frederick Coma. Uh, let me tell you everything. Okay, start weeping. I got broad shoulders. Ah, but you must take this seriously, Mr. Stevenson. It is a very serious matter. You see, the late Mr. Andrews, Lorna's husband, was a passenger aboard the Mary Arnold, and in the hold, he placed a valuable cargo. Valuable in the sum of two million dollars. What kind of cargo? No one knows for sure. Until I arrived last week, no one knew of the existence of this cargo. Not even the uh, bereaved widow, Mrs. Andrews. Why did Andrews confide in you? Oh, he didn't. The Mary Arnold was one of the last ships to escape Shanghai before the arrival of Japanese. When she sank, everyone thought that her cargo was worthless. And since Mr. Andrews perished with the ship, there was no one to correct this erroneous impression. But I have evidence to the contrary. I like to see evidence, Mr. Komar. It always satisfies my curiosity. Ah, yes, but of course. Here. Bills of lading. Official and certified. Howard Andrews, Shanghai to Honolulu via the SS Mary Arnold. Sealed containers. Estimated value, $2 million American. Signed R. Markham and Son, Shanghai. Where'd you get this? I, uh, found it. Yeah? Yes, Mr. Stevenson. Last month, going through some old records in the shipping office. It was sheer luck. No doubt. Why don't you take this to Mrs. Andrews? Mm, unfortunately, I did. But she... She seems to feel that the percentage I require is more than she wishes to pay. So... So that's where I come in. Of course. And I assure you that working with me can be most profitable. While on the other hand, cooperating with Mrs. Andrews could prove disastrous, even fatal, if you follow my meaning. I'm way ahead of you, Komar. Good. But just one thing. Yeah? Don't ever get too far ahead. I made a tentative appointment with Mr. Komar, went back into the bar and did some tall thinking over a tall drink. And I looked up your address in the phone book and went out to your simple little $500 a month apartment near Diamond Head. Hello, Tom. I've been waiting for you. Well, I'm here. You were all rouged, powdered, and negligee, and looking very fetching indeed. Can I get you a drink? I think we better talk business first. Hmm. Before pleasure? Yeah. I saw Mr. Comar this afternoon. He offered me a deal. I'm not surprised. Are his facts straight? Uh-huh. And you didn't know about this cargo before? No. There were a lot of things my husband didn't tell me. He was a bad boy. Sometimes. Suppose I take the job for you. Fine. My price is expenses and 10% of whatever we find. Comar offered you more than that, didn't he? Well, maybe I think the stuff belongs to you, or maybe I just like working with you better than with Comar. Maybe. When do we start? As soon as I get a boat fitted up. It's a deal, Tommy. And you don't worry about your percentage. I'll make it worth your while. I didn't keep my appointment with Mr. Comar. We were too busy. Two weeks later, we had the salvage ship fitted out and anchored just off Molokai Reef. We checked the equipment, we tested the pumps, looked over the airline, and checked my suit. Then I slipped into my 32-pound boots and was ready for the helmet when you came up and got your lips in the way. This is just for luck, Tommy. Thanks. 
You helped me put on my helmet. And I climbed over the side and into the glistening green water. Down I went, feeling very much like an elephant with two trunks. Into the quiet of an ocean with a bottom 175 treacherous feet below me. The ghostly undersea light faded as I dropped, and I was all alone in a black world, black as death. Ten minutes later, I hit bottom and switched on my searchlight, and there she was, right in front of me, a gaping hole in her side, and still painted on her stern the words, S.S. Mary Arnold, Honolulu. I reached out with one of my hooks and pounded on the hull. The sound disturbed a giant squid, and he swam out past me. I stepped in beside him and walked forward. The pile of sealed aluminum containers was sitting in the hole waiting for me. I I pried one of them open, and there it was. Fat, neat little packages of currency in large denominations. Currency, millions and millions of dollars. think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. And now for the surprising conclusion of Cargo Unknown, a Hamilton Whitney production starring Lyle Talbot, written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt, and directed by Frank K. Danzig. I surfaced slowly, my arms loaded with the stuff. When I got to the deck, you were waiting for me, Mrs. Andrews, but you weren't alone. I'll take that money, Mr. Stevenson. How'd you get here, Comar? A speedboat. I decided to let you do the work and to content myself with the profits. Now I'll take that money. Okay, stop waving your little pistol. Here, you're welcome to it. Tom, you can't. And you would go down for the rest? If you really want it. What are you doing, Tom? There are millions of dollars that belongs to me. To, to, to us. You can't just give it away, please, Tom, please. Take it easy, Lorna, and you too, Komar. Sure, there's millions of dollars... Probably eight or nine million. The bill of lading said it was worth two million American. That is correct. And it was ten years ago. What do you mean? These are Chinese dollars, friends. They've gone down a little in value. If I remember right, at the last rate of exchange, the whole business is worth about 500 bucks. And so, my dear Mrs. Andrews, I'm enclosing my bill for $6,000 expenses. You can forget about my percentage. I don't expect that you'll pay this bill, but I believe in trying. Yours truly, Thomas J. Stevenson. Cargo Unknown starred Lyle Talbot. Listen again soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. (laughs) 
This program was transcribed in Hollywood. What kind of person does it take to build a civilization from the ground up? Astronaut Nick Burke will have to learn how to be a leader if he wants humanity to survive on a new planet, even if he himself is no longer human. Nick Burke dreams of successfully creating the first sustainable space colony in human history. After a third failed mission on Mars, Nick returns to Earth heartbroken, but during the trip home, he has an epiphany caused by a near-death experience on how to truly accomplish his dream. Nick launches a billionaire-funded startup company that solves the interstellar travel problem, transporting people in a spaceship without any people aboard. After Nick lands on his new, distant planet, he has to combat his greatest trials yet, including raising children and goats while becoming a colony-building survivalist. Fans of Andy Weir's The Martian and Dennis E. Taylor's We Are Legion, We Are Bob will find familiar themes of innovative science fiction ideas with plenty of humor and pop culture. The hard science fiction novel Seed by Matthew G. Dick, narrated by Darren Marlar. Here are a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Good evening, Creep. Welcome to the Mystery Playhouse. Creeps, over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So on the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women come the strange impulses which urge them into the unknown. Listen now to the border of tonight's Mystery Playhouse presentation of Dark Venture. Marge was a sweet kid. We might have become very good friends if we hadn't made the mistake of getting married. At the end of the first year, I was ready to throw in the towel. I was really tired of the whole thing. When she'd come home from work and chatter about everything under the sun, I tried so hard not to yawn in her face. Darling, you know the front bedroom? Well, it's just going to waste. And today at work, I thought of a way to get us some extra money. Your voice bored me, your face bored me, your hair, everything about it. I was thinking of putting an ad in the paper and running the room until you can get on your feet again. All the time she talked, I kept imagining how swell it would be just to get up and go through the door and never come back. Money would pay our grocery bill and... Oh, honey, you weren't even listening to me. Huh? Oh, sorry. I I was thinking of something else. (laughs) I'll tell you what. Since you're such a deep thinker, my sweet, I'll pay you a whole nickel for your thoughts. Save your money, baby. If I told you what I was thinking, you'd want a refund. I wanted to leave with all my heart. But where would I go? I was down to borrowing quarters from old friends and stealing dimes from my wife's purse. So I let things slide. That's why I'm in this mess. For you see, if I'd left then, I wouldn't have bumped into the old guy a week later. Yeah, there he was, in our apartment, fiddling around with the door to the front bedroom. Oh, afternoon. You must be Mr. Jordan. Yeah, that's right. What's uh, going on here? I'm Mr. Hawkins, new boarder. Oh. Yes, rented the room this morning before your wife went to work. Answer to the ad, you know. Yeah, Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I remember saying something about it. But uh, what are you doing to that door? Oh, installing the double lock? I asked your wife. She said she didn't mind. Well, she may not mind, but I do. Why do you need a double lock? I have my reasons, Mr. Jordan. You do, huh? Well, I don't like the idea myself. 
Neither my wife or I would touch anything you've got. Oh, it's not that. I don't want you putting a lock on that door. Well, sure how. That's right. All right, Mr. Jordan. I'll find another way. Another way for what? Oh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Screwy little word, if, can really drive you nuts. If I'd been listening to Mars that first night, I wouldn't have let her rent that room. And if the old man hadn't been there when I came in, I wouldn't have gotten sore and left the house before Mars got home. I wouldn't have gone down to Jerry's bar. I wouldn't have met Ruthie. She was at the telephone when I came in. Then she started walking toward us. Well, still no answer, Jerry. There's nothing to show up. Better luck next time, Ruthie. That's a lot of propaganda. Next time, it'll be just like this time. When I was born, the eight ball business started booming. <laughs> Don't take it so hard. Uh, Jerry, I think what the lady needs is a stimulant. Who well, asked you what I need? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. What I need is a bottle of strychnine and some nerves. <laughs> That was Ruthie. And there was something about her right from the start that pressed a button in my brain. I forgot Marge and how bored I was and old man Hawkins who tried to put a padlock on his door. I forgot everything but Ruthie. Then about a month after we'd met, I came back in that same bar again. It was almost closing time. There was something wrong. I, I could feel it. Ralph, I, I think the word is out. Reader's vein or something for what I want to tell you. Huh? I'm leaving town next week. Where are you going, Missy? Out west. Maybe L.A., maybe Frisco. But why? Because I've been battered around so much I'm punch drunk. Because I promised myself I'd never let it happen again, and it's happening. What's happening? I'm falling in love with the wrong guy. You. Ruthie, don't go away, please. I'll go crazy if you go away. But I am. In a week, like I said. But, uh, if something comes up before then that would give me a reason for staying, well, uh... Feel free to telephone. Well, she left. There wasn't a thing I could do about it. I wanted to bust the whole world right in that jaw. What could happen in a week or a month that would do me any good? I was dead broke. I didn't have enough money to follow Ruth to the edge of town. I'm just sitting there thinking. I started getting a funny feeling. Someone was watching me. I looked up quick. It was Mr. Hawkins, our boarder. Oh, hello there. Hi, Mr. Jordan. Hey, what are you doing here, spying on me? Why should I spy on you? Ain't a crime to take a little drink now and then. Just had a few myself. Celebrating. Oh. Well, this place is closing up. You going home? Yeah. Mind if I walk along with you? Do as you like. It's all the same to me. That's the way you want it. Well, here we are. Up the stairs, eh? I hope you don't tell your mission I was drinking. Uh, some women don't like to rent rooms to tell us to drink. Well, I won't tell her. And someday I won't have to worry about things like that. Someday I'm going to have a sweet little grocery store. with rooms in the back and I'll do what I please. Yeah, let me open the front door. Yep. Five thousand dollars all I need. Almost got it. Well, you better be quiet or you'll wake my... You almost got what? Ah, uh, what do you think I won that double lock for, huh, Mr. Jordan? I come into my room. I want to show you something. Thirty-five hundred dollars. Where would you get thirty-five hundred dollars? Am I working for twenty-five years for other people? Am I living in rented rooms all my life? Now, look at here, Mr. Jordan... Right here in this dresser drawer here. Now, if you don't believe me, look at here. $3,500. Nobody knows about it. You wouldn't know about it either. <laughs> if I wasn't so drunk. $3,500. Yes, fellas really do things with this kind of money, eh, Mr. Jordan? <laughs> Marge is sleeping soundly. I closed my eyes, but sleep was a million miles away. If something comes up before then, that would give me a reason for staying. 
Well, feel free to telephone. Thirty-five hundred dollars. We could go away together. All the bloodhounds in the world couldn't find us. Oh, that wasn't true. The old man would make a bigger noise in bikini. The nab is quick. I looked at the little luminous clock that stood in the dresser. Ten after three. A uh, fellow could really do things for this kind of money, eh, Mr. Jordan? You know, to get the money, I'd just about have to cut his throat. I couldn't stay in bed any longer. I got up and went to the old man's door. I listened. There wasn't a sound. Thirty-five hundred dollars. And it was so close. Yeah, what was that? I turned quickly and... I didn't want it to sink through the floor. Marge was there. In the dark hallway. Watching me. I, uh, I couldn't sleep. I, I was just going to ask the old man if he had some cigarettes. I said I was... Hey, what, what's wrong with you? Marge? Marge? She's sound asleep. Sound asleep. I wanted to start laughing. I wanted to laugh till the tears ran down my eyes and cheeks. Sound asleep. And I remember that before we were married, she jokingly mentioned something about sleep, wasn't it? But my year of married life had never happened before. I had other things to worry about. Funny thing, my last conscious thought before I fell asleep was this. She walks in her sleep. I told Marge about her sleepwalking at breakfast. She said she hadn't done that since she was a kid. It worried her. I told her there was nothing to worry about, but... After she went to work, old man Hawkins, who ate breakfast at the house, shook his head. I don't want to scare you, Mr. Jordan. I'd send your wife to the doctor and... About sleepwalking? Oh, it's nothing. I don't know. I knew a fellow once, walked in his sleep. One night, he bumped into a bed where another fellow was sleeping, started beating him up. Huh? Yeah. The next morning, this sleepwalking fellow wakes up all covered with blood, and he doesn't remember a thing. I had to put him away. You can believe me or not, Mr. Jordan, but it's the truth. I believe you. Baby, you told me to call if something came up. Well? Does the $3,500 sound like something, Ruthie? Yeah. Oh, but it's still not as important as us being together. We'll be together. Sit tight and be a good girl, sweetheart. Everything's going to be all right. When I hung up the phone, I saw my fingers were as wet as if I dipped them in water. How long would it take me, I wonder? How long would it take me to sell Marge on the idea that in her sleep, she was planning murder? I waited a few days, getting everything straight in my mind. This wasn't for marbles. Everything had to be right. Then on the third night, I started things going. Marge was sleeping. I waited. And after a while... Marge! Marge! Hmm. What? Marge, what's wrong? Uh, huh? Oh, Ralph! Oh, you were having God. a nightmare or something. Nightmare? Oh, but... You must have been dreaming about old Mr. Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins? Well... Why in the world should I be dreaming about him? Well, I don't know. He kept repeating his name over and over again. Something troubling your mind? <laughs> Two nights later, the house is very quiet. I went down the hall to Mr. Hawkins' bedroom. I listened. Not a sound. I started rattling the knob as... Someone might in their sleep when they're trying to get in. Who, who's there? Well, the door now violently. And I pounded on the door. Now, what do you want? 
Go away. Then I heard him getting out of bed. I hurried back. I reached our bedroom before he came out in the hall. As I crept into bed again, I thought, Rosie, darling, it won't be long. morning at the breakfast table, the old man acted just as I hoped he would. I hate to bring this up, but... You hate to bring what up, Mr. Hawkins? Well, I'd like to ask your permission once more to put a double lock on my door. A double lock on your door? Why? You folks hear anything unusual last night? What do you mean? Someone tried to break into my room. That's what I mean. Break into your room? Oh, that's ridiculous. Now, who'd want to do that? I don't know. I ain't accusing anybody, you understand. But, well, I... Yes? Yeah. Well, Mrs. Jordan did walk in her sleep that other time, and me? I... Me? Do you think it was me? Well, now, uh, I didn't say that. You most certainly did, Mr. Hawkins. I just want to put a double lock on my door, that's all. Well, you won't put a double lock on your door, Mr. Hawkins. My husband disapproved last time, and I most certainly agree with him. But I... Oh, there's George coming to pick me up. Mm-hmm. Well, well, maybe it was just my imagination last night. Yes, maybe it was. But no offense meant, Mrs. Jordan... No offense at all. See you folks later. I'm coming, George. The nerve of that old man walked in my sleep. Now, don't get upset. Well, just because I did it once, he must think I... You woke up the last time I walked in my sleep, Ralph. Well, did I walk in my sleep last night? Did I, Ralph? I woke up once. I was gone from the bed. Ralph. Oh, Ralph, what's happening to me? Ruthie? Yeah, I was wondering when you were going to call. I'm getting a little tired of just sitting here, Ralph. Now, it's not going to be much longer now. Uh, you remember we met a guy named George Burroughs down at Jerry's Tavern one night? Do you remember him? Yeah, I think so. Why? Listen, you go down to Jerry's today and find out where we can get in touch with this Burroughs. That don't make sense. And do what I say, Ruthie. Someday I'll tell you about it. And you'll see it makes beautiful sense. Marge. Marge, wake up. Ooh. Oh, it's seven o'clock already. Here, I'll turn this blank thing off. Uh... Oh, how I despise this little monster. Marge, I think I'm going to have a doctor look at you. Why? About your sleepwalking. What do you mean? Did I... Again? Yeah, last night. Why didn't you wake me? Well, it's dangerous to wake a person walking in their sleep. Besides, you didn't go far this time. Only over to the dresser and back. To the dresser? You were trying to open the bottom drawer. Oh, that's funny. We don't keep anything in the bottom drawer, except some papers. And, and what, Marge? And your gun. That's right. My gun. Ralph, I don't remember getting up. You didn't remember the last time. Ralph, I'm frightened. Don't be frightened. Night when you come home, the doctor will be here. <laughs> Marge came home that night, I introduced her to Dr. Burroughs. And Doc was a very versatile guy. He could do anything for 50 bucks, except produce a license to practice medicine. I watched him working on it. Oh, he was doing fine. Physically, you are in good condition, Mrs. Jordan, but of course we, uh, we were never too concerned about your physical condition, were we? What do you mean? Oh, you must be frank. What do you have against this old man? Nothing, nothing at all. That's not true. But it is. What could I possibly have against him? The subconscious mind is a dark, bleak world. Somewhere in that subconscious is this hatred. Perhaps you resent him because his presence in your house is a symbol of your economic difficulty. No, I don't think that's it. Then why do you hate him? I don't hate him. I'm trying to help you. You're in grave danger. This hatred festering in your subconscious mind, it could even lead to murder. 
me? Yes. Kill someone? Yes. I'd kill myself first. And after that, my friend, the doctor, left. Marge had made an error, but I didn't bother to correct her. You see, if my plan was right, she would kill herself, just as she said. But not before the murder. Yeah, no, indeed. When Mr. Hawkins came in that night, Marge and I were waiting for him. I, uh, I want to talk to you, Mr. Hawkins. Oh, can you wait just a minute? My friend George in the hall. I want to bring him down. Let your friend George wait. This won't take long. You will have to move, Mr. Hawkins. Move? Yes. Some uh, friends are coming, and we need the room for them. I'm sorry, but you'll have to move. Well, where am I going to move to? Ain't you heard about the housing shortage? It's my house, Mr. Hawkins. I want you to move. Hey, I'll bet you're still sore about this morning. I told I'm you. I'm not but... sore about anything. I just want you to move. All right. I guess I can find something in a couple of days. I want you to leave tonight, Mr. Hawkins. Tonight? I can't find another place tonight. Yeah, we ought to give Mr. Hawkins at least till tomorrow. I want him out tonight, Ralph. You know what? I got my rights. Our rent's paid up till tomorrow night, and I'm going to stay till tomorrow night. All right. Tomorrow you move. You understand? Yes, I understand, Mr. Jordan. Downstairs in the hallway, I could almost see Hawkins' friend George straining to catch every word of the argument. What an excellent witness friend George would be when the time came. And the time was at hand. And then something went wrong. It was after 11 o'clock. Marge was still curled on the couch. Her face quite pale. Mm-hmm. I got up and yawned. <sighs> well, it's getting late. I feel pretty worn out after all this. Let's go to sleep. No, Ralph. Huh? I'm not going to sleep. Why? I'm afraid to go to sleep. Honey, it's 1.30. You've got to get some sleep. If I go to sleep, I'm afraid I... Look, I've got an idea. What? You go to sleep. I'll stay out here and watch to see that you don't leave the room. Oh, I couldn't ask you. Well, you need to rest more than I do, Marge. Working as hard as you do. You go on to sleep, darling. I'll promise to watch. Well, all right. I'm pretty tired. Oh, Ralph. You're so considerate. But even in the bedroom, she didn't sleep. I had to get up and walk around... Bedroom light would snap off one moment and then snap back on the next. I was starting to get jittery. Why didn't she go to sleep? This was the last night the old man had been in our house. This is my last chance. Why didn't Timothy go to sleep? And then finally, she was asleep. It was almost four o'clock. I had to move quickly. I went over to the dresser and found the gun. Started getting nervous. This is a big payoff. My throat was very dry. I sat down the hall toward the old man's room. Me kill someone? I'd kill myself first. She'd still have a chance. I had no time to lose. It was already getting light. Me kill someone? I'd kill myself first. And I was standing before the old man's bedroom door. And I turned the knob and pushed against the door. I placed a chair on the other side for protection. I pushed the door open quickly. I wanted to finish this thing now. The old man awoke in terror. Hey, what's going on? I tore a pillow from the bed and pressed the gun barrel into it and muffled a shot. Hey, Mr. Jordan, what are you doing? Huh? It's empty. Too bad, Ralph. Marge. Things didn't work out quite like you planned, did they? And this time I'm very much awake. Yeah, I'm a peaceful man. I mind my own affairs. And in the middle of the night, he tries to murder me. Go back to sleep, Mr. Hawkins. I'll tell you everything in the morning. Coming, Ralph. Yeah. But listen, I want to... How did you... Before I dared go to sleep, I had to be sure I wouldn't kill the old man. So it wasn't it perfectly natural I should remove the bullets from the gun. You took the bullets from the gun? And even then you didn't go to sleep? No. For something bothered me. 
In spite of your doctor's efforts, I couldn't believe that I was capable of murder. I thought about it a lot, Ralph. And then I realized something else, too. What? I realized you no longer loved me. I began to understand all that's been going on. Now, get out of this house, Ralph. Get out! Ruthie, this is Ralph. Well, is everything all right? Everything set? Oh, not exactly, sweetheart. Not exactly? Yeah, I didn't get the money like I figured. Something came up. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. But I'm, I'm free now, Ruthie. And I remember you told me that money wasn't nearly so important as us being together. Well, now we can be together. We don't need money. We... Ruth. Ruth. Ruth! What number were you calling, sir? Oh, never mind, operator. I guess I'm all through. That rings down on Mystery Playhouse curtain for the night creeps. It's late, so good night. Sleep tight. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. past, stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, pull the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. And the truth. Are you a Gordon Pym? Are you a Gordon Pym? Who am I? I don't know. I'm trying to remember. Gordon Pym? I don't know. I 
I was down on the waterfront looking for the old whaling vessel, Grampus. Captain Bernard was in charge, and though I hadn't seen the old captain in more than ten years, I still felt he was a pretty good friend of mine. I could remember him telling Dad and myself some pretty wild tales. I drank it all in, main rig, compass, and anchor. Maybe I never would have seen the old captain and his son, Weston, if I hadn't been visiting some friends in Boston. I was reading the shipping news one morning, and there it was. Benjamin Bernard, experienced whalers wanted to man vessel Grampus, sailing July 13th, 1 a.m., 1881. Well, I packed my digs, slung them over my shoulder, took a lungful of salt air, and, well, six hours before sailing time, I was looking for the ship. It was dark as I walked down the waterfront, and I stopped the stranger. Yeah, bud? What do you want? I'm looking for a whaler known as the Grampus, and I think I'm lost. There it is, right in front of you. What's the matter, can't you read? Yeah, it seems that way. Thanks, fella. Uh, do you happen to know if Captain Bernard's on board? Yeah, he's there. You shipping out on her? I'm looking for a job. I'm pretty green, but I'm an old friend of his. So... I'm an old friend of his, too. I was out on his last voyage. I wouldn't ship out again under that yellow curve. I was to stop first. When Dirk Peters says, don't go, don't go. What's the matter? Is the ship haunted or something? Nothing's the matter with the ship. The captain's nuts. Are you sure you're talking about the same man I am? There's only one Captain Bernard, and that's him. He and his son both. Two of a kind. Don't take my word for it. Ask any man that was aboard the Grampus last trip. Ask Sanford Allen, our second mate. Talk to the cook, little Tony Matsay and Sale. Ask him. Captain got playful and cut little Tony's arm off. Look, I'll take you aboard. I've been trying to collect my scratch ever since we landed two weeks ago, and I get word tonight it's ready. Uh, watch out for the loose boards on the gangplank. Yeah, I see what you mean. I'm right behind you. I don't think this ship's sailing tonight, Mr. Peters. Look at that sky. Ah, yeah, little squall on bother Bernard. Human life's cheap. Climb over the gunnel. It's fastest. All right. Uh, it's a dirty-looking ship. Captain Bernard! Captain Bernard! Well, I guess he's in the cabin aft. Follow me. Uh, that doesn't sound like a little squall, does it, Mr. Peters? Yeah? Oh, incidentally, my name's Gordon Pym. Everybody's got a name. My is like that, I guess. Now we get on the passageway here. Captain Bernard, I... All right, men. Take Mr. Peters... And his friend, and put them in iron. What? What's this? Uh, you dirty swine, you double crosser! Yeah, the cap, Peters. Take them down to the hold until we sail. Aye, aye, then we'll see what you have to say, Mister Peters. Why be in Shanghai, Mister Pym? Shanghai. Three hours, Mr. Pym. Your friend, the captain, ought to come below any minute with a pep talk. Now that we're too far at sea to swim back. Wait a minute. Allen. Sanford Allen. Is that you in the corner? Yeah. Kind of cozy, ain't it? All of us together here like this, huh? What'd they do, slug you two? Yeah, with the old payroll gag. Come up and get your pay. And they slug you. Heh. <laughs> Guess who else is here? Tony? Yeah. Tony, how's it going, Tony? I stick the knife in his belly someday. That's what the Tony Monteo do someday. Stick the knife. Yeah, you better not stick the knife or you get swinging the head on the gallows. They call that mutiny, Tony. Oh, uh, meet Mr. Allen and Tony. This is Pim, Gordon Pim. Hi, Hello. Pim. Hello. How long are we out for, do you know, Allen? Sure. Six months. You listen to the Tony Peters. Listen to Tony. We stick together this time, you know? He cut off my arm. Someday I cut off his head. Ah, shut up. It's a lot of gab. Not that's life, I guess. The, the captain says for you to go on deck. Well, 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 if it ain't the kid. What you doing aboard ship, Weston? Playing sailor? Mr. Peters, I, I didn't know that... I, I'm sorry. That... Sorry. He's sorry. You didn't know that we was going to get shanghai when you come down and tell us the pays rolls made out. You lying, sniveling yellow pig. Well, honestly, ah, I... I... forget it. You're in the same boat. Oh, uh, here's a friend of yours, Weston. At least, 
That's what he says. Friend of mine? I have no friends. No friends at all. I... Watch out, Mr. Manzeo. Don't touch me. Johnny, not touch you. I don't want to get my hands dirty. We don't want no dirt in our food, huh, Tony? I... I can't help what Father does. I never wanted to be a sailor anyway. You know that, Mr. Peters. You know that. I hate the sea. Hate the doggone thing. Ah, oh, leave the kid alone. Come on, Alan, before the captain begins to howl like a bull. Hello, Weston. You don't remember me, do you? I... No. No, I... I don't. The name's Gordon Pym. I used to live next door to you in Nantucket ten years ago. You remember? Gordon. How did you get here? I came aboard looking for a job, and I got one, but not the kind I'm looking for. Oh, I hadn't any idea, Gordon. Gordon, wait till you see Father. Wait. He's so changed. All of us are so changed. You'll see. We walked slowly up to the deck, and we lined up. Two lines, ten men. Ten of the toughest, dirtiest-looking men I've ever seen. Captain Bernard kept moving his hand back and forth, sort of a nervous habit, and then started to stand muster. He didn't recognize me, and I didn't mention our old friendship. As the days went by, he seemed to take a kind of joy in making a fool out of me. But then he didn't treat his own son any better. As for Peters, he hated him and wanted to get something on him. But Peters was smart and stayed out of trouble. He was the only man who wasn't flogged during those first 40 days at sea. One night, we called the ten-man crew to a secret meeting and advised him never to try and talk to the captain. Well, a storm was brewing on the 42nd day of the journey, and I was called into the captain's cabin. I opened the door. You call for me, captain? Yes, Mr. Pym. I called for you. Shut the door behind you. You're just standing there like an idiot. My son tells me that you're giving out free advice these days. Gordon, I didn't. I didn't. I, I swear. Shut up. Neveling swine. Calling you my son makes me ill. Father. <laughs> now, Mr. Pym. I heard you've been advising the men to obey me blindly because you think I'm an idiot mind. Captain Bernard, I said nothing of the kind. Don't lie to me, Mr. Pym. I've known you for many years. Oh, so you do remember. I couldn't very well forget, could I? Despite my idiot mind. I tried to treat you as I've treated the other men. You've taken advantage of me. Whispering behind my back. Trying to turn my son against me. Plotting with Mr. Peters. I'd have none of this on board my ship. Gordon, he's making it up. I, I never said it. Are I, you I never said calling it. me a liar, Weston? No. No. You I... see, Mr. Pimp? My son denies it now. But I checked his story through our cook. I don't you admit it, Mr. Pimp. I thought I was helping you. That's what I told him, Gordon. Shut up. When have I asked for your help? Answer me, Mr. Pimp. Answer me. Well, you didn't, sir, but... But what? What did Mr. Peter say to you about my idiot mind? He said nothing at all, sir. Nothing, is it? No, sir. Tell me the truth. It is the truth, Captain Bernard. Liar! I'll cut your lying tongue out with my own hands. What did Peter say? Nothing, sir. Nothing! Leave him alone, Father. He's telling the truth. Don't hurt him. He's my friend. My only friend. The only one I ever had. I leave him alone. Since you love this friend, my son, I'll allow him the pleasure of trying to make a man out of you. Mr. Pym, you'll take this neverling son of mine and tie him securely to the mainmast. No, Father. For the no. no. Then when he's secured no. inside, you will report to deck for 40 lashings until I get the truth about Peters out of you. Yeah, but it's suicide for a man to be tied to the mainmast in this weather. If anything Captain... happens to him, Mr. Gordon, you'll pay for it with your life. So be sure he's tied securely. Those were the captain's orders, and we obeyed him. The wind was screaming through the sails like an insane witch on a broomstick, but Weston and I climbed to the cross trees of the mainmast. 
It was a tough climb, and I think he knew then it was the end for him, but he was afraid to disobey. When we reached the cross trees, I lashed Weston's arms and legs firmly, hoping he could survive the storm. By the time he was made fast, I patted his hair and tried to soothe that poor lost boy. The last I remember of him was his tear-streaked face and the look in his eye. I waved goodbye to him and climbed slowly and carefully below to report for 40 lashes. Captain Bernard, Mr. Pym reporting, sir. Take off your shirt. Yes, sir. Place your hands behind the whipping post and hang on securely, Mr. Pym. And think carefully. Try to remember the words Mr. Peter said about my idiot mind. Yes, sir. The mainmast, Captain Bernard. It's the mainmast. Up down for the mainmast. It's cracking. Bernard, and you've killed him. You dare say that to me. You murdered Yes, I warned you of this, but you wouldn't listen. I'll say it. I'll say you're insane. Beat us. Beat us. Throw this man in hand. Are you talking to me, Captain Bernard? Throw this man in. Take your hands. Help me, Peters. This man isn't going to captain the ship any longer. You don't need Mr. Pym. Do you realize that? Do you want to swing on the gallows, Mr. Peters? I can't hear you, Captain Bernard. Ain't that a shame? I just can't hear you at all. Just truss your arms up. You'll swing with his feet. Let me go. Let me go. You'll swing with it. Ah, oh, shut up. Here. I'll tie this gag around your mouth. That will keep you quiet. The crew's coming topside. The storm's let up for a little while and the course is set. Do they know, Gordon? I thought we'd tell them when they got here. Well, we got to work fast. This calm ain't going to last and we won't be able to steer no course at all with the main must gone. Hey, what's at this special meeting about them? Oh, look, Alan. Look at the captain. Peter. Look at him. Did you? Yes, Mr. Allen. It's a mutiny. Are you with me? I cut his head off. No. Shut up, Tony. I ain't getting mixed up in no mutiny. Is this your idea, Gordon? Yeah, that's my idea, all of it. If any man swings around here, it'll be me, so listen to me. You should have asked us, Gordon. We don't like getting dragged into something like this. Now listen to me, man. Nobody will swing for this if you use your heads. Nobody has to know this is mutiny. So, he's all right. We'll kill the captain. Tony Mansell, cut his head off. And then we say he chose to die. No. no, Tony. We can make this look like a shipwreck. The captain gets put in a lifeboat and set adrift. No, no, Tony, cut his head off. Shut up, Tony. Go on, Jordan. And we all know the captain's nuts. In two or three days alone on the ocean, he'll be a babbling idiot. Idiots don't talk sense even if they're found. And even if he is found, he'll look like a shipwreck victim. What about the boat? We're going to scuttle her. Get off on lifeboats when we're near land. Within two days, we'll be ten miles off Cape True. We can row to safety, and it'll be up to you men to keep quiet. Now, are you with me, men? No. Yeah, with you. We're with you. All right. All right, let's go. And work fast, you monkeys. Because we're in for a whale of a blow tonight. I was so smart. Smarter than anybody. You could see it then. I had the whole thing planned perfectly from beginning to end. We lowered the captain in a lifeboat, gave him some biscuits, a compass, and a jug of water. But I didn't figure on the storm that was to come. But the storm broke soon after in all its mad, screaming fury. We couldn't control the Grampus. She was like a wounded animal, and I thought for a minute she'd sink by herself that night. There were eight men left then, being the kid and the captain was gone. We had to lash ourselves to the deck to keep from being swept overboard. But during the night, four of the men were lost. 
It seemed to me that the ocean was fighting back the mutiny. Water poured into the ship. The entire belly of the ship was waterlogged, and only the top deck was riding above the ocean. There were three lifeboats on the Grampus before the storm, but we lost them during the night. And then, toward morning, Alan screamed out, You blasted fool, Gordon! We can't scuttle this ship even if we want to now! What do you mean, we can't scuttle it? It didn't sink, did it, Mr. Peters? Ah, shut up. The hold of this boat is filled with empty oil casks, isn't it, Mr. Peters? Yes, Alan. I forgot about that. Well, what's the difference? Difference? You land lover, them empty oil casks is full of air. They'll act like a balloon and keep this rotten whaler from sinking. Is that true, Mr. Peters? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, we can set the ship on fire. What good will that do? We're burn alive. Don't even say you don't set the ship on fire. There's no life about it. Yes, Trey. Ah, shut up, all of you. Let me think. Just gonna have to set tight and wait. Wait for what, Peters? Wait and pray we get saved. Maybe a ship will pass by. You'll hang, Peters, if we're saved. You and Gordon will hang. I had nothing to do with the mutiny. Me and Tony's free and clear. Ain't we, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, nothing to do with the non-mutiny. Just wait. Wait. Wait and pray. We did wait and pray. Waited for 13 horrible days without food or water. 13 days. And then one morning, Alan began to complain as usual. So thirsty. So thirsty. How many of us are left, Gordon? It's not light yet, Peters. I don't know. How do you feel, Gordon? I'm not sure. Take it easy, kid. The sun will come up shortly. Alan. Yeah? Where's little Tony? Tony! He isn't around. I heard him scream last night for water. I guess he jumped overboard. Listen to me, you two. We can't last much longer, and you know it. We've been drifting like this for 13 days. 13 days without any water. We can't keep it up, I tell you. We can't keep it up. Water! Water in God's name, I need water! about it? No, Peters, I know how he feels. All you can do is scream for it. Even the salt water looks good to me. What's the matter with you, Gordon? You going off your nut? Listen to me, both of you. There's just three of us left. None of us can last very long floating around on a... on a derelict ship. None of us. But there's a chance. There's always a chance we can be saved. If we can last... What are you getting at, Alan? One of us will have to die so the... so the others can live. One of us must. No. No, Alan, if we all die here first. Maybe you won't, but I will. You were the ringleader, Gordon. You started this thing. You'd hang if we got to land, so would you, Peters. But I'd be free. I got a knife. Put that knife down. Alan's right, Gordon. If any of us is going to live, one of us has got to die. Yeah. Oh, Peters, no. It's better to die Shut than... Up, Gordon. I don't know what I'm saying. Alan's right. It's two against one. Yeah, two against one. We're going to choose for the privilege. There are three pieces of wood. Take them, Gordon. Hold them in your hand. The man who gets the shortest stick is the victim. Is that level with you, Alan? Sure. All right. Put your knife right here in the middle. Okay. There it is. Okay. Choose, Alan. This one. It's short. Uh, it's my turn now. There. Yours is the long one. Who is the shortest miner, Gordon's? Let's say. Gordon? Yeah. It's you, Alan. No. No. No, I won't. I'm the one that should live. I'm innocent. Give me that knife. Let go of it, Alan. Oh! You double crook. Take that, Peters. And that. You... Uh, 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 now I get the knife. And... No, Peters, you... you oh. 
Dead, Peters? Yeah. I just... I... What's the matter with you? You all right? I'll, I'll be all right. I'll always double-cross Alan wounded you badly, Peters. Ooh. I'll get some salt water and wash the blood off you. That'll keep the wound clean. It's too deep, Gordon. Look. Look ahead. Look, Gordon. I see the outline of land ahead. Land! Uh, it's just a mirage, oh. Peters. You think it's land? No. Look. Look straight ahead. You're right. Land. Land ahead. We'll be saved, Peters. Peters. Peters! But Peters was dead. Peters and Alan lay side by side. I climbed over the gunwale of that ship and started for land. I don't know how I ever made it. I couldn't swim four miles in good condition, yet I swam four miles after 13 days of no food or water. I climbed out of the water, wet and tired, and fell exhausted on the beach. I don't remember what happened after that. I was in a native village of some sort, I knew, and some native women had taken me in and cared for me until I was well. They thought I'd been shipwrecked. They would have kept on thinking it, too, if it hadn't been for the first day I was well enough to walk around. I stopped in at the settlement's only inn to figure things out. As I opened the door... What do you mean there's a derelict ship out there, eh? I mean what I say. All the grampus. This old loon keeps saying he was once the captain of that ship. Oh, loon. I'm crazy, eh? You men think I'm crazy. But I'll prove I'm sane. There was no shipwreck. It was mutiny. Mutiny. And my son was killed. He did it. Yes, he did it. Mutiny. And he did it. There he is. Right there. Standing at the door. Look at him. Don't let me get away. Don't let me get away. Hey, mister. You mustn't get away. Mister. Come over here. Talking to me? Yeah. Come on over here to this table, stranger. This old loon claims he knows you. Yes, I know you. Don't I? Then answer me. You were hired on board the Grampus and led a mutiny against me and you'll swing for it. I was picked up three days after you put me in that rowboat. I've stayed alive for one reason and one reason only. To watch your body swing from the gallows. Tell these men the truth. Speak up, man. Speak up. Are you a Gordon Pym? I demand an answer. Are you a Gordon Pym? Well, mister, are you? It's your word against his. Tell the truth. Are you a Gordon Pym? Frankly, I don't know who I am. I guess I'm just something washed up out of the sea. Yeah, I'm just somebody washed up out of the sea. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard narrative of Arthur Gordon Pitt. Bellkeeper. Hold the bell.
If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. Gentlemen... We seven scientists have banded together because the government of Austria is in deadly peril. We have evidence that Austria is being dangerously undermined by the Nazis, and that nothing is being done from the standpoint of the law to prevent it. We have therefore resolved to take measures into our own hands and prevent this chaos. At our next meeting, we shall present the names of those in high places who attempt to divide and conquer, and shall decide then as to what action shall be taken against them. And such was the organization in which Hans Minkler, the young, mild-mannered biologist of Vienna, suddenly found himself a member. Hans Minkler, whose whole life was dedicated to the preservation and the saving of human life. Hans Minkler, referred to by his classmates as the man who couldn't kill a fly. Saturday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the incredible tale of the letter. Hans Minkler, the young biologist, only half heard the speech of the leader of the seven scientists, for Hans was dreaming of his beloved experiments his experiments, and the pretty niece of Monsieur Gallet, the lovely Vielle, who had been living in Vienna these past four years. Kindly Monsieur Gallet was interested in Hans Minkler's theories, and Hans was hoping Gallet might finance them. Well, Dr. Minkler, I've studied the outline of your proposed experiments, and I've come to the conclusion that you can accomplish great things. Oh. Well, that makes me very happy, Monsieur Gallet. How much do you think you'll need to carry on? I feel quite sure that I could get along for a couple of years on 5,000. If my cell experiments prove successful, 
Human life may be prolonged considerably. I have all the faith in the world in Hans, Uncle. <laughs> My niece has certainly sold on your ability, Dr. Minglin. So are you, Uncle. You may as well admit it. Young men with your principles are all too scarce today. Europe seems to be saturated with men who claim they want to save mankind. They all seem to want to arrive at it through a destructive method. Well, it's only a temporary condition. Who do you plan to have assist you? Kurt Lassner? Kurt? Um... Well, I haven't decided yet. Kurt is a fine young man. Yes, he was a good student, but he's drifted away from his studies. He's become absorbed in politics. Very well, Hans. I'll start you out with 5,000. Is that the way you want it, Biel? Yes, Uncle, you're a darling. Oh, I hope that someday I, I may be able to repay you. See who that is, Biel. Come into the library, Hans. I'll give you a check. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Oh, good evening, Kurt. Hello, Biel. Well, how are you? Very well, Kurt. Mm, you're very lovely this evening. Thank you. Yes, indeed. The prettiest girl in Vienna. Uh, is Hans here? I said I'd pick him up on my way downtown. Uh, yes, he's talking to Uncle. Uh, talking business. <sighs> my, I've had a busy day. Not enough hours to go around. Sit down, Kurt. Thanks. Kurt, why have you given up your career? Biology? No, oh, I don't know. But you could do so much good. You were so well equipped to carry on in science. Think of the things yet to be done. I'm going to do things. Great things. I mean things that will really benefit mankind. Well, that's what I mean, too. <laughs> you know, you sound like Hans. Hans is very sad about your dropping your work. He counted on your helping him in his experiments. Oh, he'll get over it. Besides, those experiments can wait a while. No, Hans is going ahead. Who's going to help him? I am, if no one else. You? Well, how can you help him? I can learn biology. But it'll take a lot of money to do what he planned. He has the money. It's all arranged. My uncle has financed him. Your uncle? Yes. Well, I wish Hans luck. And I'm going to marry Hans. What? You and Hans? Well, what a surprise. Yes, I've made up my mind. I see. Well, I guess... Ah, good evening, Kurt. Glad to see you. Oh, good evening. Hello, Kurt. Oh, have you heard the good news? Oh, yes, Viel just told me. And I wish you both good luck. I hope you'll be very happy. And when's the wedding? Uh, wedding? What wedding? Oh, yes. <laughs> Me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Typical absent-minded professor. See, look, I have the money for my experiments. Well, Hans, hey, it's quarter to eight. We better run along. We have an appointment at eight. Hmm? Oh, yes, the meeting. I'd forgotten. Yes, I'll be right with you. Goodbye, monsieur. Bye. Good night, Bia. Darling. Good night, Hans, dear. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> So Hans Minkler reluctantly attends his second meeting and with Kurt Lassner joins the five scientists in the darkened room. The single low lamp on the table casts their shadows on the wall. The leader is speaking so, again. Gentlemen, we have learned who these fifth columnists are. So it is our duty as loyal citizens to take action against these men. We have learned who the leader is and naturally he must be the first one to go. In this envelope I have his name. We will now draw lots to select the one among us to carry out instructions which will be read later. Are you ready with the straws, Kurt Lassner? Ready, sir. This is an old and simple method, but since there are only seven of us, it will suffice. Proceed, Kurt. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All of us have drawn, sir. Good. Here is the envelope containing the name of our victim. Who has the short straw? Well, I, I guess I have. Hans Minkler. Here's the envelope. But before you open it, we must tell you what the committee has decided to do about this man. He is to die. Die? And that task has fallen to you. You mean this man is to be murdered? Exactly. What? You don't know me, gentlemen. I, I'm a saver of life. I, I wouldn't consider such a thing for a moment. Herr Minkler, you are a member of this group. You know our secrets. It will be best for us and for you if you completely forget your scruples. Oh, but uh, I can't belong to a society with such diabolical purposes. Why, I didn't realize what this was all about. Oh, no, I withdraw. It's too late to think about withdrawing. Do you mean that you actually expect me to kill someone? You have been selected. You are fools. Oh, I couldn't kill a fly. I couldn't harm a living thing if the whole country went up in smoke. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. You're not scientists. You're a band of madmen. Fiends. Sit down, Hans Minkler. We're not a band of madmen and we are not fiends. We are loyal patriots of Austria who are determined to save our country. 
Any one of us might have drawn that straw. Well, I don't want to be a party to such a plan. I'll not commit murder. Unfortunately, you know too much about us now to pull out. And suppose I refuse? Then you will accomplish nothing. Not only will we eradicate our selected victim, but we'll see to it that you are eradicated with him. Who is this victim? Open the envelope. Very well. What? Why, you are insane. The whole lot of you. You see, a galet is the soul of honor. You see, a galet is one of the most honest men I've ever met. Monsieur Galet is the leader of the Nazi party. I here. don't believe it. Why, I'm to marry his niece. Did you say, Monsieur Galet? Yes, you know that's ridiculous, Court. He'd never do such a thing. Galet is the leader. We have proof. He also has a very lovely niece. And I'm sure you'd want nothing to happen to her. Would you, Herr Minkler? No. No, I wouldn't. But you, you must give me time. Time to think. There is nothing to think about. It has been decided. Galet must be exterminated within 12 hours. Very well. And there's nothing else for me to do. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, Herr Minkler. And remember, if you don't accomplish this task within 12 hours, we will be forced to take care of you. And if we can't find you, we will find the girl. Yes, I understand. Good night. Well, Hans, what are you going to do about it? You've sat in your apartment for two hours now. Which shall it be? Three lives are at stake. The uncle's and yours and VL's. <laughs> Hans gets his car and drives to Monsieur Gallet's home. Well, hello, Hans. What on earth are you doing here? I didn't expect you back this evening. Where is Viel? Why, she went to some friends. She probably won't be back till after midnight. What on earth's wrong with you? Get your hat and coat, Monsieur Gallet. What? Have you been drinking, Hans? Get your hat and coat. Now, wait a minute. Suppose you explain... There's no what... time for explanations. Get your things. What for? You're coming with me. <laughs> I'm just ready to turn in. You better run along, Hans. you feel better in the morning. Put up your hands, Monsieur Gillet. What? <laughs> this is the funniest thing I've ever encountered. Have you really got a gun in your pocket? I have. I hope you don't force me to prove it. Well, this is certainly a surprise. The meaning of all this... I've just discovered that you're the leader of the Nazis who are trying to undermine the Austrian government. <laughs> are you serious? Yes. Who told you such a thing? There is an organization which is determined to eradicate all Nazis one by one. And you are the leader. Read this. It says, Leader Paul Gallet. Death. This is the maddest thing I've ever heard of. I've been highly active in anti-Nazi work. Uh, they say that's merely a cover-up. Are you a member of this secret organization? Yes. You've been selected to kill me? Yes. Unbelievable that you, Hans Minkler, could be mixed up in such a thing. I think you're being hoodwinked. I am an anti-Nazi. If you plan to kill me, you must belong to the Nazi organization. Get your things and come along. What do you intend to do with me? That's all planned. Come along. Very well. No, you. Give me that gun. You fool. No, 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 no. You. Monsieur. Monsieur. Good Lord. Han stands staring at the body of Monsieur Gallet for a few moments. Then in a daze, he turns out the lights, closes the library door, and returns to his apartment. <laughs> for the remainder of the night, he sits at his desk staring into the darkness, lost in thought. And then morning comes, and Viel at her home opens the library door and... <laughs> Well, he's been dead about eight hours, Fräulein. Who on earth would do such a thing? He had no enemies. He was quite active in anti-Nazi work. Good. Here's something we found on the library floor. The, the pipe? Yes. The bowl is hand-carved. has initials on it. As you see, the stem is broken. Have you ever seen this pipe before? Well, 
I don't remember. There's something else we found, a note, which reads, Leader Paul Gallet, death. Do you recognize the handwriting? No. Do you know anyone whose initials are H.M., the initials carved on the pipe bowl? Yes, the, the pipe belongs to my fiancé, Hans Minkler. Your fiancé. What time did you return home last night? I attended a party and got here about one o'clock. I supposed Uncle was in bed. I didn't look in the library. I went straight to my room. What is Hans Minkler's address? I'm sure Hans had nothing to do with this. Are you? He... He lives at 13 Cronhead Street. I'll run over there. Please don't touch anything in the library. I won't. Good morning. Court. Court, something terrible happened. Uncle was murdered last night. The police have just left. They, they found Hans's pipe on the library floor. It, it was broken. They've gone to his apartment. Please come over right away. <laughs> Hello, Hans. This is Kurt. The police found your pipe in Galais' library. They're on their way to your place. You've got to get out of the country immediately. Don't wait a moment. Oh, Kurt. Kurt is terrible. Now, now, control yourself, Ian. Oh, Kurt. I can't imagine why anyone would do such a thing. Kurt. You know where Hans is. Well, I suppose he's at his apartment. Hasn't he called you this morning? He usually does, but he hasn't. They found Hans's broken pipe near Uncle's body. Could I must warn Hans. I must let him know what's happened. Oh, it's pipe, huh? Yeah, that's bad. By all means, phone him at once. Oh, you call him. Of course. It's chronic start 4347. Right. Ring. He must be there. Oh, he would have answered by now. Where could he be? I haven't the slightest idea. But he always calls me before this. Could it? It isn't possible. It can't be. Oh, no, now, just try to control yourself, Yale. Oh, see who it is, Kurt. Special delivery. Sign here, please. Well, thank you. Who's it for? For you. Kurt. It's from Hans. Good heavens, read it. Leaving Vienna on important business. Contact me at 16 Rue de Roche, Paris, under name of Pierre Cabot, H.M. Well, I don't understand it. What does he mean? What important business? Why should he disappear like this? Oh, I have no idea, but it does look strange. Your uncle is murdered and Hans disappears. Oh, but what motive could he have had? But they found his pipe near Uncle's body. Oh, you know Hans had nothing to do with it. I'll admit he's always been rather peculiar, never seemed to let loose, always seemed to be on his guard, but well, I can think of no reason for this. But what could this important business be? He never told me of it. And why on earth should he go to Paris under an assumed name? Well, that is strange. Kurt, that officer said something. What? Well, oh, you know the knuckle was active in anti-Nazi work. Do you suppose it could be a Nazi? No, why not? But who? Who do we know that's a Nazi? I, I certainly Wait don't... a minute. You just said that you felt Hans was always on his guard. Do you mean you felt he was concealing something? Well, there have been times when I felt that, but on the whole, I've thought of him as a slow-thinking, absent-minded professor. But it does seem strange that the moment Uncle gave him the check, that this should happen and he should disappear. Well, maybe he went to visit our old pal, Jean Renault. You remember, Jean. He was one of our classmates. I could have a strange feeling that Hans wouldn't go away like this without telling me beforehand, unless something were wrong. Do you... Do you suppose that Hans has been deceiving us all along? What makes you ask that? Well, it suddenly occurred to me that he spoke French without the trace of an accent. And I remember Jean Renaud said once that he spoke English without an accent. Well, so what? Well, if he did, where did he learn to do that? Certainly not by living in Vienna all his life. I see what you mean. Why didn't he tell me beforehand that he was leaving? But he wrote you this letter. Yes, but it wasn't written by the Hans, I know. Oh, I, I think you'd better forget about it. Could I didn't tell you this. The police found a note on the floor. It said, Leader Paul Gallet, death. It must have meant that Uncle was an anti-Nazi leader and he was sentenced to die. 
And if this ties in with Hans' disappearance, then Hans must have been connected with the Nazis. Oh, darling, you're getting yourself all worked up. You don't think Hans was a Nazi? Well, I'll admit, the way you've got it all worked out, it sounds plausible, but if he was a Nazi and he's left the country, what can we do about it? He won't come back. But why should he go to Paris? Well, Jean Renault was a good friend of ours. I'm sure Jean knows nothing about Hans being a Nazi. Jean would never suspect him. Maybe Paris is his next assignment. Nazis are just as busy in France as they are here. Let's see that letter from Hans. He says here, contact me, 16 Rue de Roche, Paris. That's Renault's address, 16 Rue de Roche. Oh, good, good. I just can't believe it. How could I have been such a fool? I'll see who it is, darling. I'm Captain Gruber from police headquarters. Oh, come in, Captain. Sorry to trouble you again, Furlan. But we went to Herr Minkley's apartment. He wasn't there. He wasn't. His car's not been in the garage all night. That's strange. We found this writing on the notepad on his desk. Is it his handwriting? Yes. He's written the same two words over and over again. Galle and Lier. As though he tried to make up his mind about something. But what's become of his car? The car's been found. Where? In the public garage. From all indications, Minkler's left the country. Probably for France. Oh, why France? We've discovered that Hans Minkler is a French citizen. A French citizen? He always led us to believe that he was a native Austrian. Now, uh, we'll want to check things over a little further. We'll be back this afternoon. Please don't disturb anything. No, no, we won't. By the way, what is your name, sir? Hmm? Oh, oh, my name is Kurt Lasner. Good day. Kurt, what did you see? What were you looking at just then? Well, what do you mean? What startled you on Uncle's desk? What? Well, well, nothing, nothing at all. Here, let me see. Good heavens, I see it. Here on the desk blotter, Uncle's handwriting, it says, Find Hans Minkler. And it was, Hans. It was. Uncle was trying to tell us who did it. Oh, maybe. Oh, to think that he could be so low as to take Uncle's money and then kill him. Oh, please be ill. I just can't believe it. I won't believe it. I must well, I'm sorry to say that all the evidence is certainly against him. Oh, come, Yale, try to get this off your mind. Try to get some rest. The police will take care of everything. Oh, yes, good. I guess you're right. If Hans did do it, he'll pay. He's the one who'll do the suffering. Believe me. <laughs> But during the night, the Nazi hordes rolled swiftly into Austria and, without firing a shot, took over the reins of government. A few weeks later, France declared war. Then one night, Hans Minkler makes his way through the maze of Paris traffic and knocks at the door of number 16, Rue de Roche. Oh. Yes? Oh, good evening. Good evening. Is Jean Renault in? Who shall I say is calling? Why, um... Pierre Cabot. Won't you come in, Monsieur Cabot? Major Renault has just stepped out. He'll be back shortly. Was he expecting you? Uh, no. Did you say Major Renault? Yes. Since war has been declared, he's gone on the active service list. Oh, I see. I've been phoning for a week, but no one answered. You haven't seen the Major in some time? No, no, I haven't. I've been in Austria for several years. Renault and I went to school together in Vienna. Oh. Are you by any chance... Hans Minkler. How did you know that? Why are you traveling incognito? Well, I am... Well, yes. Where is Renault? I regret to inform you that Renault has been in Africa for some time. He's due back in a few weeks, however. Did you know Monsieur Gallet in Vienna? Why, yes. Who are you? I'm Monsieur de Vaux, of the French Sauté. Oh. oh, police. Yes. Did you ever accept any money from Monsieur Gallet? Why, I... Why are you asking me these questions? You never accepted money from Gallet? No. Search him, Larry. No, just a moment. Sorry, Minkler. I'll take the bill for Larry. I don't understand all this. You understand, all right. Well. So you never received money from Gallet. What's his check for? Well, uh, that's to help carry on my experiments. Undoubtedly. Monsieur Gallet was helping you and quite a number of others to carry on experiments. Others? I suppose you say you're new at this game. Game? 
I don't know what you mean. I had nothing to do with his death. Nothing. Yes, I believe that. Why should you kill one of your own? I don't know what you're talking about. If you were intending to carry on experiments in Vienna, why is this check drawn on the Bank of Paris? Well, maybe he had a surplus of funds here. (laughs) Indeed he did. How did you know I was coming here? We knew. Just what were your plans? Oh, this is ridiculous. I'm not a spy. I was engaged to marry Galay's niece. Really? Some way I got mixed up with a, an organization which planned to rid Austria of all Nazis. <laughs> they claimed that Monsieur Galay was the leader in Vienna. I denied it. Yeah, but nevertheless, I, I was selected to, to murder him. Oh, I see. I'm told that if I refused, it, it'd also kill me and my fiancée as well. I decided to get them out of the country. I went to Galay's home. My, my fiancé was not there. I knew there was no time to lose. So I tried to take him away by force. He was suspicious of me. We suddenly got into a scuffle. And, and then, then someone behind me fired a gun. I don't know who it was. And Galay fell dead. I see. I, I went to my home. Next morning learned that they were looking for me. I got out of the country and in a roundabout way I, I came to Paris. A good story. But it doesn't hold water. Galay was a Nazi leader, and there's too much evidence against you, Minkler. Come on. Let's go now to headquarters. Two weeks later, Jean Reno returns to Paris. Then, six weeks after Austria surrenders, Kurt and Viel escape from the Nazis and make their way to Paris. Jean Reno meets Kurt on the street and asks him to bring Viel to visit him at 16 Rue de Roche. Come in, Court. Well, well, Viel. It's been a long time. How are you? Excellent, thank you. So you two are married. Well, my congratulations. Though I didn't expect it to work out quite this way. No? Why not? Well, I always had an idea that you might marry Hans Minkler. Well, one never knows. <laughs> no, Kurt. One never does. By the way, uh, have you seen Hans? He's in Paris. Been here for several weeks. Has he? Yes. Don't tell me you haven't seen him. He told us he was coming to visit you. Oh, yes. He's in Paris. I wasn't here when he arrived. He left several notes. I found them when I returned. Do you know where he is now? Yes. Would you like to see him? Yes, I would. Hans is dead. Dead? What? Dead? Yes. He was executed as a Nazi spy. A Nazi spy? Yes, I got here too late to help him. They had conclusive evidence against him. Why, that's ridiculous. Hans is dead, nevertheless. But what happened? Well, it seems Hans got into some trouble in Vienna and came to Paris to see me. In some way, the Sûreté here was informed that he was a Nazi, was coming here to carry on. But who on earth would accuse Hans of such a thing? I wonder. But they received a letter from Vienna accusing Hans. Suarte found a check on him from a high Nazi official. There was nothing that could save him. A check from a high Nazi official? Who was the official? Paul Gallet, the heir's uncle. What? Didn't you know about your uncle? I don't believe it. Whether you do or not, he was a Nazi. The Secret Service has known it for years. He may or may not have given the check to Hans for Nazi purposes. But the evidence was against Hans. Then the letter came to the Sûreté saying Hans was a Nazi agent. They found him here, arrested him. That's all there was to it. But who would write such a letter? Hans had no enemies. Would you like to read the letter? Yes. Here it is. Hans Minkler, under alias of Pierre Capot, has given evidence of being a Nazi spy. Locate him at 16 Rue de Roche, Paris. And that's all that was necessary. How awful. I I can't imagine such a thing. Notice the handwriting, Kurt. What? Why, yes. Viel, this is your handwriting. It is not. I'm positive. You wrote this. No. Don't lie to me. I know your writing. You wrote this letter. All right. All right, I did. I was convinced that he'd deceived me. I was convinced he killed Uncle. Yes, I wrote it. How could you? I never dreamed Uncle was a Nazi. I thought Hans was a Nazi. I was determined to make him suffer. 
You believe me, don't you? Yes, Vian. I believe you. But I'm awfully, awfully sorry for you. Oh, poor Hans. Poor Hans. Oh, I'll never forgive myself. <laughs> Yes, Biel, what a terrible injustice you have done. But someday, perhaps you'll learn what really happened to your uncle. It wasn't Hans who killed him. Hans didn't even have a gun, just a pipe. But Hans wanted to get him safely out of the country. And Kurt knew that Hans would never go through with the order of the Secret Seven. So he followed Hans. And when he saw what was happening, he shot Galay and disappeared and let you think Hans did it. Because Kurt was in love with you, too, V.L. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler... Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler, will return to tell you the strange tale of Out of the Fog. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In the near future, virtual reality games are indistinguishable from the real world. Players can take on the role of a star quarterback or rule as the king of a virtual kingdom. Thirteen-year-old Jake prefers to spend his free time building Zaloria, a virtual world he created from scratch, where he and his two best friends, Des and Carrie, spend their afternoons completing quests and collecting treasure. However, all in Zaloria is not what Jake expected. When Jake discovers that the world he built is growing and changing on its own, he and his friends uncover a secret that could change the world forever. Jake and his friends must fight for survival when his virtual world takes on a mind of its own. Game Alive, a science fiction adventure novel by Trip Ellington, narrated by Darren Marlar. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange Wills Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William And featuring Marvin Miller and Lorraine Tuttle with Howard Culver And the original music of Del Castillo I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins Despair Anger, jealousy, revenge, lust, envy, and hate. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills gathered from probate courts the world over. Many of them written on deathbeds or under highly emotional circumstances. Clearly show that the writers of the wills use this last chance of self-expression to vindicate within their own hearts the flagrant sins of omission and remission made during their lifetimes. Names, places, and time have all been changed in order that no reflection may fall on any person or persons living or dead. From the dusty vaults of the probate court, we bring you documentary proof of the old adage that man is the strangest of all creatures. You'll presently see what I mean. But first, I'd like to have you listen to a few words from your announcer.
now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Black Interlude. Of all the sins that live within the human heart, none is so deadly, so lasting as hate. Unchecked, it bears the bitter fruit of mental and spiritual annihilation, nor does it always end with death. Its vibrations reach out of the grave like the tentacles of an octopus in a last effort to win the final victory of a bitter revenge. Why did Francis X. Blair hate his only son, Paul, with a hatred as intense and boundless as the elements? The reason is as old as Eve. Francis X. Blair, rich, handsome, and a widower, and his son, Paul, were both in love with the same girl. Francis X. Blair had been my client for nearly ten years. He was dominant, relentless, and headstrong, the kind of a man who took what he wanted, no matter what the hurt. Paul was like his dead mother, shy and sensitive. His talents ran to the literary. How he ever managed to take the lovely and beautiful Phyllis Lamar away from his father, I'll never know. But insiders told me that it was just a case of love at first sight. Everyone who knew about it was anxiously waiting to hear whom her final choice would be, father or son. And then one cold November night, Francis X. Blair invited me over to his penthouse apartment to discuss his will. I knew that something extraordinary was about to happen. Telling me to be a good loser, John, may be the conventional thing to say. But unfortunately, I've never lived in the conventional manner. Oh, why can't you forget and forgive them both, Francis? After all, Phyllis has made her choice. And while she may prefer Paul as a husband, <laughs> you can still have her as a daughter. I'm sorry that I can't agree with you. I consider my son in the light of a thief. A love thief, if you like. But the fact remains that he deliberately took away from me the one thing in my life that I cherished most highly. I would have preferred it if he had robbed my safe. It would have been more honorable. He's got to pay for his sin, and she will pay for her folly. Why don't you sleep over it for a few days, Francis? I'm sure that with sober It reflection... won't be necessary. I have made my final decision. From this day on, my son is disinherited. I want you to redraft my will, cutting him off with one dollar. But surely you aren't serious. Paul is just out of school a few years. He isn't equipped... Let him starve, then, and the girl with him. She'll come crawling back to me on her knees one of these fine days, begging my forgiveness. Francis, I beg you not to be hasty. I'm sorry, but it's too late. I hate Paul Blair as I've never hated another soul, living or dead. I want him to suffer, just as he has made me suffer. I'll hate him until my dying breath. And if I can, I'll go on hating him from my grave. And this is the last time I will ever mention his name again, as long as I live. Nor did the next two years bring a change of heart. Francis X. Blair grew more bitter day by day, if such a thing was possible. His will was prepared and executed according to his wishes. But I still hoped that before he died, he would relent and repent. Paul and Phyllis, meanwhile, were quietly married and were living in a small furnished apartment on the outskirts of town. On the night of their first wedding anniversary, they invited me to dinner. <laughs> and I want to offer my congratulations on this, the first year of your happiness together. And don't think we haven't been happy, Mr. O'Connell. Paul has been wonderful. Well, I had to make up in some way for all the millions she lost by not marrying Dad. Oh, why is <laughs> such talk and nonsense? <laughs> no, how is Dad, Mr. O'Connell? You know, I haven't seen or heard from him in almost two years. Tell me, has he softened any? No, I'm afraid not, Paul. In fact, he's more bitter than ever. Of course, there's always a chance, always the possibility, man. We don't want any chances, do we, Paul? We have our own plans now, our own dreams, too. I think good comes out of everything, Mr. O'Connell. If Paul hadn't been disinherited, do you think he would ever have taken a job as a reporter? That's where he learned to write. And I agree with you, Phyllis. I think Paul has a brilliant future as a writer. One day, with you behind him... Oh, oh everything would be fine if... if Dad would only forgive me. I know it sounds foolish to you, Mr. O'Connell, but... his continual hatred for me is preying on my mind. You see, I've never hated... And, and the thought of someone hating me, well... I'm sure you feel badly about it, Paul. But you see, you've wounded your father's ego. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing to do to anybody. I've told Phyllis this before, and she laughed at me, but I want to tell you too, Mr. O'Connell. Sometimes I... Well, I imagine I hear my father laughing at me. 
laughing as though he expected something to happen to me, something... Oh, please, Paul, get that thought out of your mind. Nothing that your father can say or do will change anything. Our lives are our own. We're the masters of our own destinies. Voodoo, witchcraft, and superstitions are obsolete. And when next you see Francis X. Blair, Mr. O'Connell, <laughs> please ask him to stay out of Paul's dreams. He may not know it, but I'm getting a problem child on my hands. But I never saw Francis X. Blair again, that is, alive. He died in his sleep just two days after my visit with Paul and Phyllis, and he had neither forgiven nor forgotten. I attended the funeral and sat with Paul and Phyllis. Paul looked disconsolate, discouraged that the hatred in his father's heart was being carried to his grave. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, et pater et filius, et spiritus sanctus, requiescat in pace. Amen. As the little funeral procession walked slowly out of the church, I wondered if this was to be the end of hate. Surely death would be the great healer. Had not the late Francis X. Blair done enough hurt to more than compensate for his lost love? Well, I thought so. But early one evening, several months later... Yes? Mr. O'Connell? Yes. Oh, Mr. O'Connell, this is Phyllis Blair. I've only got a minute to speak to you. I'm here at the airport with Paul. We're leaving, Mr. O'Connell, leaving for good. We're flying to the West Coast. For good? Heavens, what's happened? Paul is standing just outside the booth. I don't want him to hear me. Mr. O'Connell, Paul said that he couldn't live here another day. Since his father's death, he's grown worse instead of better. He says that he hears his father still laughing at him. He says if he doesn't go immediately, he's, he's liable to, to lose his mind. Oh, I've got to go now. He's getting suspicious. Phyllis, I want you to keep in touch with me. I'll help you, both of you, all that I can. Maybe it's best to... Hello? 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 Number, please. Oh, never mind, operator. So this was it. The hatred of father for son was really living on, coming up like some shrouded ghost from the tomb to encompass and destroy. I recall the old familiar proverb, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I wondered why they stopped with a woman. What about a man? What about the dead? Where did fury end, I wondered. A few months later, I received my first letter from Phyllis. The change had done Paul good. He'd turned to freelance writing and was concentrating on radio scripts. They were building their lives anew. Yes, it was a long way from the grave of Francis X. Blair to the West Coast. Long enough, I hoped. I felt happy about Paul and Phyllis for the first time in months. But one night, quite unexpectedly, I received a telegram. It was from Phyllis. She told me the very thing that I'd been fearing. Paul had been committed. Committed to an institution for the insane. She begged me to come at once, and I saw there was no time to be lost. How to fight against a man dead these many months was a problem that offered no immediate solution. But there had to be an answer. Of that I was sure, and I meant to find it. I left that night by plane to enlist my services in the fight against hate and its vicious allies, the seven deadly sins. Oh, Mr. O'Connell, I'm so glad you've come. I'm so glad. It's been a nightmare. And I'm glad to be here, too, young lady. I intend to see this thing through no matter how long it takes. Oh, thank you so much. Just take hold of yourself now until we have this thing licked. First... I want you to tell me everything that happened to Paul since the day you came. Then I hope I'll know what to do. Well, as I told you in my letter, Paul went into radio. His training on the newspaper was excellent, and he turned out several very good scripts. One show in particular he calls Happy Valley was seriously considered by several agencies. Paul had written over 30 chapters. You see, it's a daily serial about a disabled war veteran who comes home. And the story he tells about his readjustment into a normal society. What happened to it, Phyllis? He had a meeting two weeks ago at the agency. 
As I understand it, several people were present. Directors, actors, and a man who was to sign Paul to a contract. A Mr. Henley, the agency's producer. He took Paul into his private office. Everything was going along nicely. They were about to come to an agreement. I've gone over your scripts very carefully. You've got a fine show here, Mr. Blair. I've heard the staff read it, and they all liked it. Well, thank you very much. Very much, Mr. Henley. You don't know how I appreciate all this. Don't thank me. I'm a businessman. I'm not doing this out of sympathy. You've come up with something we like, and it's a deal. I'll have my secretary draw up the contracts. Five shows a week, 52 weeks, with an option for renewal, and you'll receive $100 a show. That's the minimum scale, I know, but still a lot of money. That sounds good to me, Mr. Henley. I'm ready to sign. No, excuse me. Surely. Uh, Henley. What? Called off. Why does he have to get a sore throat when he's singing for us? Tell him I'll fly east today. Tell him to meet me at the airport. Yes, I'll leave here in about an hour. He can't do that to me. Hey, Blair, I can't sign your contract today. I've got to rush east. Uh, Come back next week. I'll have my secretary get in touch with you. Uh, See you later. I'm sorry, Mr. Blair, but it just can't be helped. And so, Mr. O'Connell, that's how it ended. Paul didn't say anything when he came home. He retired early. And sometime during the night, Oh. What's that? Who's there? Phyllis! Phyllis! Do you hear it? Do you hear it? Paul, what is it? You what? It's my father. He's laughing. Laughing from his grave. Oh, Paul, that's nonsense. I don't hear anything. He's laughing at us, Phyllis. He's responsible for everything going wrong with me. Paul, please. I never should have married. I never should have married. Paul, stop. Stop. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. I know I'm through with everything. I can't stop my father from hating or from destroying me. It's no use, Phyllis. It's no use. I'm through. I'm through. I tell you, I'm through. Part two of Black Interlude follows in just a moment. Now back to Black Interlude and Warren William. Next day, Phyllis and I motored out to the mental institution where Paul had been taken. The late Francis X. Blair had a fight on his hands, whether he knew it or not. For a while, Mr. O'Connell, we thought he was going to recover rapidly, but then he got worse. We've been giving him shock treatments, therapy, and the usual correctives for his type of illness, but uh, unfortunately... We appreciate everything that's been done for him, Doctor. But I do have some rather interesting facts, which I hope may be of benefit in treating him. You see, Doctor, I represented his father legally. For the next hour, I told the Doctor what I knew about the strange case of Paul Blair... I told him of a plan I had that might possibly help to restore the young man's reason. It was a gamble, I knew. But it was time to put our cards on the table. It was now or never. After hearing me out, the doctor agreed to my plan. We left without seeing Paul, but in a happier frame of mind. 
Later that afternoon, I called upon a friend of mine, a radio broadcasting executive. I told him the story. Uh, what you're asking me to do may cost my job, John, but it's worth the chance. Let's see. Uh, I've got a spot tomorrow afternoon, 3 o'clock. We're changing programs. I'll sandwich your show in. But only for one day, mind you. Believe me, Joe, I appreciate that one day. But if my switchboard is clogged with an angry mob calling for my neck, you know what you'd better do, don't you? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I'll start running. <laughs> At a quarter of three the next day, everything was in readiness for the experiment. A radio had been slipped into Paul's room. Phyllis, the doctor, and I stood outside his partly open door, waiting for the moment that was to lift him from his black interlude or to plunge him forever into the half-world of fantasy. Dejectedly, Paul sat in his chair, easing off into nowhere. He looked forlorn, despondent. Our plan was a shot in the dark, but we were all praying for it to hit the mark. And then, at three o'clock, Ladies and gentlemen, a new program is making its debut at this time that I hope you'll enjoy. It's Happy Valley, the story of a disabled war veteran who comes back to his home in Happy Valley and to the girl he left behind. Can a blind hero readjust himself to the ways of normal life? Can he pick up the threads of his old world, yes, his old love, and go on as before? The story of Happy Valley is being reenacted today in towns all over the world. Real, true-to-life stories that have been born in the horror of war. If our Happy Valley can aid in the readjustment of just one disabled veteran, then we feel our cause has been most worthy. And now, to Happy Valley. You see him? Look, look, he's heard. He's looking at the radio. Oh, pray, Mr. O'Connell, pray. Folks of Happy Valley, as you all know, we're down here at the station today to welcome back our friend and neighbor, Sergeant John Watson. Five years ago, he left us to serve his country. He was just a boy then. And now he's coming back, a hero and a man. Look, Doctor. He's walking over to the radio. He's smiling. Let's give Johnny a welcome he'll never forget as long as he lives. I don't have to tell you that he won't be able to see us. He can only hear us. We all know that John Watson is blind. All right, now, let's let him know we mean what we say. Paul was listening intently now, almost eagerly. Hands in the pockets of his dressing robe, he was pacing the floor excitedly. Would our desperate gamble work out? It had to. Welcome home, Sergeant Watson. We're all mighty happy to have you back. And we're proud of what you've done, down to the last man of us. I haven't got the key to the town to offer you. You won't need it. Every home here in Happy Valley is your home, son. Yes, all yours, from now on in. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. You don't know what this means to me after being gone five years and two of it spent in a hospital. I can't see you. But I feel you, and it's the best feeling I've had in a long, long time. Oh! Doctor! Doctor, Mr. O'Connell, look, Paul! He's fallen! Maybe he's... Turn off the radio, please. Go on. Here, Mr. O'Connell, give me a hand. We'll carry him over to the bed. Careful! Move that pillow, Phyllis. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There we are. Just leave him here, please. I'll ring for the nurse and we'll attend to him immediately. Oh, Doctor, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Well, there's nothing to worry about for the moment, but I'll have to ask both of you to leave now. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Connell, that the experiment didn't work. No, I'm sorry, too, Doctor. Probably I let my hopes get the better of me. I'll let you know later whether or not this afternoon's experiment had any violent reaction. I'm afraid, yes, though... Yes, Doctor. That... I'm afraid that I made a jumble of the whole business. Thank you again. I'll call you later. 
Our return trip was a bitter one. We'd taken a chance and lost. Instead of shocking Paul out of his mental depression, my idea had caused a complete collapse. As we walked slowly into the Blair apartment... Excuse me, Mr. O'Connell. Yes? Uh, is, is Mr. O'Connell there? Uh, this is Joe Parnell at the radio station. Uh, I've been trying to locate him for an hour. For you, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Phyllis. Hello? Uh, John, where in the world have you been? I've called you everywhere. I just this moment came back from the hospital. Well, the switchboard's been swamped, all right, just as I was afraid of. Only listen to this. Happy Valley is a smash hit. Hundreds of people have called and wired their congratulations. Well, I'm happy to hear it, Joe. Only... For heaven's sakes, only what? Only that the idea backfired, Joe. Paul Blair hurt his show at the hospital and... and collapsed before it was half over. The shock was too severe. We fear for the very worst. For three long, never-ending days, Paul Blair lay unconscious on his bed in the sanatorium. I felt chagrined, angry that I'd permitted myself to take such a desperate chance. I wondered through those long hours of Paul's black interlude whether or not the evil voice of his dead father was reaching him. Had Francis X. Blair achieved his bitter revenge even from the depths of his grave? Phyllis and I waited impatiently to learn the answer. Yes? Mrs. Blair, this is Dr. Fry. Yes, Doctor, what is it? What is it? Paul regained consciousness about an hour ago. I'm very happy to say he, he appears to be quite rational. He's asking for you. Oh, thank you, Doctor, thank you. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Oh, Paul. Paul, darling. Oh, I heard it, Phyllis. I heard Happy Valley. Yes, darling. Oh, it was wonderful. Imagine my show, my first show on the air. Yes, Paul, I know. Mr. O'Connell and I were here when you heard it. Wasn't it wonderful? And you'll be happy to know, Paul, that your show is a smash hit. Service organizations everywhere are behind it. It's on the air to stay. Oh, I, I must get well, get strong in a hurry. Every day is precious to me now. I have new ideas, new shows. And I have you, Phyllis. I know now that our world's going to be new and beautiful. Yes, dear. And I know, too, that Dad finally forgave me. You see, after I heard the show, he stopped laughing. Maybe he heard it, too. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the probate cause of the black interlude. But first, here is a word from our sponsor. Here again is Warren William. After a protracted hearing, the court decided that the testator, Francis X. Blair, was of unsound mind when he made his will, and his entire estate eventually went to his son, Paul. He, in turn, gave a large part of his inheritance to a disabled veterans clinic. Paul is now a very successful writer and author. Just recently, he and Phyllis left for an extended trip through South America to gather material for a new book he's preparing to write. And about the laugh from the grave, well, frankly, your guess is as good as mine. Did Paul actually hear it? Or was it caused from an oversensitiveness together with a persecution complex? Well, if it's true that love is eternal, why not hate? If the one is possible, why not the other? Yes, why not? <laughs> Next week, I have a story for you about a last will and a testament that's stranger than any story you've ever read in a book. A pirate and a beautiful girl were shipwrecked on a lonely, deserted island. Unfortunately for him, he was mortally hurt in getting ashore. 
Because he was possessed of a considerable fortune, and because he felt that he must atone for his past sins, he decided to make a will. But he had no paper, no pencil or ink. And yet he made a written will that found its way back to civilization and the courts. And how did he do it? Well, when you hear the story... The Lady and the Pirate, you'll understand more about it. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Ken Crippen and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. of the eerie, weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They're waiting, waiting for you, now.
We know a lot of things no one suspects we do. <laughs> and if everyone will douse their lights, we'll tell a few things we knows about Ireland. Ireland, with a fairy. <laughs> That's right, Satan. Tell folks to make it nice and dark. Our cheerful little bedtime stories is best heard in gloom and shadow. Now, draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see a moonlit patch of woods in County Clare. Soon you'll hear a boy and girl are talking. <laughs> and there begins our story of the truth of death. <laughs> The Troth of Death! <laughs> oh, let me hold you in my arms again and taste once more your lovely lips. Nora, Alana, pity me. Oh, when you talk like that, you know I always let you have your way. Oh, Makushla. Oh, I love you, Bartley. Love you so. No more now. Let me go. No. Oh, please. If we're married, we should be to carry on like this. Married, we shall be soon. Oh, we are not yet. When will you be after telling your father of us, Bartley, and asking his consent? Why, why, whenever you wish it, sure. Do you put it off because of fear your father will object? And how could he object to you? Oh, he's a rich, proud man, and you're his only son who's been sent to city schools. Sometimes I'm often thinking he'll not be happy to have anyone so poor and ignorant as Nora O'Neill for his daughter-in-law. Nora, darling. Well, tell me, fair. He's not already forbid our marriage. My father's never said a word against you. And if he should, his words would have no weight, for I'd give up everything in all this world for you. You tell me truth. Can you disbelieve me as I take you in my arms? Oh, let me go. Please, no more kisses. Nora, Alana, pity me. Oh, you know I can't deny you. <clears throat> Enough now. Take me home. Not yet. Yes. Mother will be waiting for me. I'm treading lightly on the lichen. Sure, the banshees are about a moonlight night like this. <laughs> You're a superstitious Cassine. Can you never be persuaded there are no such things as fairies? How different you are since you've been away to city schools. You don't seem to believe in anything anymore. I believe in love. My love for you that overflows my heart. That's all that matters. Will you tell your father of it soon and ask his blessing for it? Be sure he said no word against me. Never a word. And I'll tell him soon. Now kiss me again before I take you to your mother. No, no, please. Nora, Alana, pity me. Oh, you know I can't deny you. I love you, Bartley. Love you so. Ah, crickets, crickets. So it is back in this house, you are, you creatures. I hope this time you'll come for luck. It was after your last killers that the banshee wailed for Seamus, my man who now lies in his grave. Would it be this time a useless old woman like myself you're after cursing? Showed me you wish no evil on a sweet gossine like me daughter Nora. Now he is bred in salt for ye his doonings. Stay in this house and welcome. But this time be your visit for good instead of ill. Come in, whoever you are, and peace be with ye. Good evening to you, Susan O'Neill. Good evening to you, Michael Glennon. Is it alone, yeah? Are you advised to see that I am? And who did I hear you talking? What does I just pass by your windy? It was the crickets. May the son of God preserve us. You were talking to the crickets? Aye. Close they are to the little people. And much harm or good they can bring to the house they enter. Crickets. Little people. Bah. Michael Glennon, you know not what you say. Ah, oh, they've stopped their chirping. Quick, speak them soft. Apologize, or they and the she's will do you harm. Oh, enough of such old woman's talk. I'm here for speech with you concerning Bartley, my son, and your daughter, Nora. I've come to warn you that all goings on between them must end. What do you mean? My Bartley has been to school in Galway. He's an educated man. And I have ambitions for him that I'll not be after seeing spoiled by his marriage with an ignorant country wench. Is it after telling me he's either that simple Connaught Lennon objects to marriage with an O'Neill of Ulster? You see my point. The O'Neills are no longer kings in Ireland, whilst this Lennon myself owns the richest farm in County Clare. There can be no marriage, as I've already told me, son. You, you've told Bartley? Weeks ago. Yet every night she's called here for my Nora. Now they're out together on the haste. So I've suspected, and that's why I've come to warn you's fair. I saw you was a fool when just now you passed mortal insult on the crickets and the she's. But are you such a fool as to think you can curb young men and women in their love as you curb horses in their traces? Bartley is my son. 
You'll see, I'll mold him to my will. Uh, no, Butley, no. No, 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 pity me. So? Sure, and I pitied you enough this evening. Now you've had your last kiss. Darling, just one. Oh, you know I can't deny you. I'll do the warning of your girl myself, Susan O'Neill. Sure, and there's no stopping a fool. Do so, and you must. Bartley! Oh, oh, Father! Come inside here, both of you. Oh, Mr. Glennon, what? Come to your mother, oh. Nora, my angel. Try and stay with her. You, Bartley, come here with me. Oh, Father! No words. Long ago, I told you to leave off courting of this girl. Bartley, you said... Long ago, he knew me wish... And now this night he'll know me will. Either he breaks off seeing you forever or he's no longer son of mine. Away from him I'll take everything that I've given. The money from his pocket and the roof from over his head. Father, wait. You've heard me will. Say what's your choice. But say it now. Father, you don't know what you ask. Have pity. Oh, tell him, Bartley. Nora. I leave this house. You either follow me... Or you stay behind for good. No, no, Father. You either come with me now or stay. The Father, Father, wait for oh, me. Oh, Bartley. I'll join with you, Father. I'll join oh, with you. Oh. oh, Mother. And I believe the lies he told me. Oh, Mother. Lord, <laughs> my angel. Oh, Trish, it's I might have known it was an omen when you stopped your cherubim. Again, you brought evil to this house and gone away. <laughs> Oh, Nora, you must believe me. I swear to you, I knew not what I did last night. You talked to me of marriage, known all the time it was against your father's wish. Then you followed him and his mind, after I'd given you my heart. But I didn't stay. I'm here again with you at that same trysting place. Yes, in secret. Oh, Bartley. I'll marry you, darling, as I said. Father, money, nothing matters beside my love for you. You must believe me. You must take me to your heart again. Oh, Nora, Lana, pity me. Oh, I want to believe it's true to you speak. But you failed me one day. I'll never fail you more. Oh, Bartley, make me sure. Sure? And how will I prove it? Would you have me gather the stars from the sky and lay them at your feet? Shall I steal the moonlight from the waters for you? Anything I'll do to gain your love again? Will you plight with me the truth of death? The, the truth of death? Yes. Will you climb to the top of the fairy spink with me and swear our marriage with the locks of hair and the wedding ring from the hand of a corpse? I, I have no ring from the hand of a corpse. I have here the one my father wore. I took it from his finger as he lay in death. Oh, it is a fearful oath, the truth of death. You fear to take it. You do not love me. I swear I love you. Oh, lie to me no more. Go, get your gun. No, I must kiss you again. I must hold you in my arms. Oh, let me go. Now go and leave me. I want to see you never more. I'll do anything you wish to when you're back. Come, we'll climb the fairy spink. With you, I'll plate the truth of death. Give me a hand and start the climb. Don't mind the rocks and brambles. Like me, they're all eager to caress your soft white beauty. Be quick. Let's reach the top. You're not going to plight the truth, disbelieve in what you swear. You've said the little people are but foolish women's tales. You believe in them. That's all that matters. What will be the anger of the fairies if you plight the truth in jest? And terrible their vengeance. I'm not afraid. Sure, I'd brave all hell itself for you tonight. Let's quickly say the truth, for I'm hungry for your lips. Here. We're at the summit. Tread softly here, for the she's are all about. Oh, you look as if you really see the little people. I do. In the scapular I wear is the dust of a four-leaf shamrock. Mother gave me. With a charm like that, you can see them plain as day. Good evening, little people. I wish you joy and health. You're always kind to lovers. So hear our troth tonight. Oh, you seem so sure they're here. I... Well, let's leave this ghostly spin. Without the troth? I... Uh... Oh, no, too great is my desire for you. But let's be quick. You have a knife. Cut the lock of hair from your head. There, there, it is done. Give it in my hand. I do the same with mine. Here, take it in exchange. Now break the ring in two. The gold is thin and soft. I break it. A wedding ring from the finger of a corpse. You keep one half and give the other half to me. Now take my hand. I speak the truth of death. Oh, is gloomy here. Oh, son of God, and all the saints bear witness. Wait! I thought it was only on the shares you meant to call. I speak the truth of death. You swear it with me, or we part forever. I... I'll swear. Oh, son of God, and all the saints bear witness, and fairies of the glen, and fairies of the hills, all spirits of the oceans, earth and sky, 
Witness how we plight our truth. Oh, the air is thick with shadows. The spirit here, the fairy sea. Look upon this man and I. Here before thee, we now plight our marriage. With a ring from the dead, we bind our vow. And with locks of our living hair, never shall we break our oath. Never shall we be untrue, one unto the other. Oh. If this pledge be broken, may the guilty one be stricken dead and suffer punishment to God's great judgment day. I, not only you, do swear this oath. You, Bartley Glennon, swear it too. I, I, Bartley Glennon, swear it too. No, 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 I'm afraid. No, give me back my oath. The troth of death once plighted stands forever. Oh, Bartley, I love you. I'm your wife now. Take me in your arms. Happy creatures. As if it wasn't enough evil you wrought in this poor house since two years ago you came before. Sure and for all I spoke you decent and gave your bread and salt. Come in, whoever you are, and taste me with you. So, tis you, my children. Ah, uh, so is an O'Neill. Is it hating me forever you'll be because of the black-hearted son I brought into this world? Why have you come to this house of shame and sorrow? To tell you Bartley's ship is coming home. At last. I, well, as you know, I didn't want him to marry your daughter. But I'm asking you to believe that when I sent him away two years ago for a voyage round the world, I didn't know the harm his lying tongue had wrought. I'm a hard man, but a just one. And that's why I've come tonight. Yes, you was but a man. Neither hard nor just. Only vain and foolish. Perhaps you're right. Where is Nora and the babe? Out by the fairy spink. Every day she goes there, hoping your Bartley will come back and fulfill his vow of holy marriage. Mm. I hear her coming now. Mr. Glennon. Oh, peace be with you, Nora. Is, is it you've come to say you've heard from, from Bartley? Yes, his ship is coming home. Oh, pray the thing. My prayers are answered. Did you hear that, little Seamus, my babe? Your father's coming home. Nora. If you'd but accept a little money from me... Money? My... To all only you? Get you from this house. Sure I didn't mean... There's the door. Get out. I'm sorry. When my son comes home, I'll see that justice will be done. You'll see. You who molded him to your will and brought this all about. Get out. I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, Mother, I'm so happy... At last he's coming home to keep the truth. Yes, he's coming home. Ah, Chrissy Chadunas, Chalapi now for good or ill. Oh, Patrick, my lad, pour me out another drink. Faith is chaperone, so it is hard to make the liquor find the glass. Ah, I've done it. Yeah. And now, Bartley, tell us some more about how you win the girls. Oh, it is a talent I have in a system. Of course, first you've got to tell the vain soon she's the most beautiful creature on all God's green earth. Then, if she remains cold or afraid of herself, I appeal not only to her female conceit, but also to her sympathy. I make her think I'll fall dead at her feet from love if she doesn't ease my heart with a kiss or two. <laughs> Molly, or Bridget, or Kathleen, I see, looking deep into her eyes. Oh, Alana, pity me. And it works, my lad. <laughs> it works. Such blimey is that. How can I help it for? Fire all sails! All hands aloft! What is it, Stephen, you want me? Sure, you look all battered. Captain's orders. All hands on deck. You passengers, no sleeping. We're not in any danger, are we? Uh, that no one knows when they're at sea. It's a step storm. How far are we off oiling now? Just off Hag's Head. If we don't go on the rocks, soon we'll be in Galway Bay. You two passengers are lucky. You can stay dry here below. Put us back on deck for me again. Oh, sure. It's as if the devil was at sea tonight. Or as if the shades were reaching out for this ship and me. What's the matter with you, Bartley? For the last two days, you've been talking of the little people. Uh, for the last two days, we've been approaching home. Patrick, you've been to school like me. 
Yet you believe in the little people. Can schools make you forget what your mother taught you as a babe? Oh, I used to think so. Now, when I'm coming back to Ireland again, I'm not so sure. Patrick, do you also believe in owls? What kind of owls? The kind you vow to heaven and the spirits and the she's. Sure, I do believe in that kind. I won't. She forced it on me. Blinded me, she did, with the whiteness of her skin, the softness of her body, and the beauty of her face. I won't believe. Twist me, lad, you're drunk and talking riddles. Uh, yes, that's it. I'm drunk. Uh, that's what makes me afraid of things I don't believe in. And soon we'll be in Galway, only 50 miles from home, and from the fairy spink. I won't get off this ship. The shees can't get me here. What are you talking about? No, nothing, nothing. The shees can't get me here. Uh, what's that? What? The clay. It is but a whistling of the wind. No! Hey, listen. It sounds like the keen of a woman. I hear nothing but the stone. Oh, once more it wails. She called the spirits of sea and sky as well as earth to witness. Badly you're drunk and talking mad. Oh, I know it. I know that keen. It's the wailing of a banshee. The banshee of my death. Crickets crap out your tunes in this poor old house of mine. Here again, I give you bread and salt so you know that we wish you well. Can you tell what song they play tonight, Mother? The best bet at last for good instead of ill? It is hard to say. But I think, sweet Nora, that your bathy will be coming soon. Oh, this ship should have entered Galway Bay last evening. Mother, that wail in which I heard, it was but a whining of the wind. Yes. It was not a banshee. It was a whining of the wind. Oh, it, it must have been. I shouldn't worry. But there's always danger for the men who sail in ships. An easy death at sea would be too good for one of his black heart. No, I've never believed his heart is black. He was only weak and thoughtless. And I love him. Yes, you love him. But you're sure it was just the wind that wailed last night and not the banshee of his death? Oh, Mother, you know how I prayed for him to come to me at last. He'll come to you. Which he, she vowed the troth of death. And so spirits and the she's will bring him to our door. It is midnight and time for us women to be in bed. I'll be staying up a while. Who knows? He may come tonight. Who knows? Sure, the little people know and do all things. Good night, sweet Nora, and God bless him. Good night, Mother. And the blessed saints protect you. Good night, crickets of awning. Please, heaven, you cherub for good this night. The little people know and do all things. Who oh, fairies of the glen and fairies of the hill, spirits of the ocean, earth and sky, bring my Bartley back to me. Laura. Nora. Bartley. Nora. Nora. Oh, you've come to me at last. I'm coming to meet you, Bartley. Nora. Nora. Oh, Bartley, dear, where are you? Lover, I cannot see you. Nora. Where are you, dear? Where are you? Lost, forever lost, from a broken clock. I'm punished to God's great judgment. Oh, Bartley! Nora, Alana, pity me. Pity me. Oh, pity me. oh it was not a well in the wind I heard last night. There's nothing I must wait for now. <laughs> Ah, crickets, again you brought the banshee wailing by this house. For there's been a keening for me girly Nora. And her babe sleeps beside her in the churchyard's blessed grounds. Will it now be this useless old woman you're after cursing crickets? 
Sure, and it's all right. When you get it over with, this heart will be yours alone. Come in, whoever you are, and peace be with you. Good evening to you, Michael Glennon. Uh, good evening to you, souls and all here. Do you mind if I sit down in your chimney corner? Sit yourself and welcome. The waves have passed. The keening's over. My son is dead. And my daughter. She couldn't live without him. And the bed. Our grandchild, too. Our grandchild. Just a man I was, you once said. Neither hard nor just. Only vain and foolish. Yes, just a man. So a fool. It is lonesome when you're old and all alone. We won't have long for lonesomeness. Nothing is long except eternity. Nora. 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 Every night he walks abroad, a formless ghost that none can see. Nora. No. Searching for her always to repair his wrong, but never will he find her till the judgment day. No. Punished forever for his sins. Oh, Lord. And how will mine be punished? No. Here, cricket, your creatures, is your bread and salt. Satan. <laughs> you folks come see us when old Nancy has a birthday again. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio